given. How do you just oppose? Does it mean one of you is not telling the truth? And who is not telling the truth? Thank you, Mr. Is, Speaker. Is the board chairman's answer before us? Is it on record here? Mr. Mr. Speaker, the board chair is official. I will mean, uh, deny at, that. At, that, at, that is his answer before us. Yeah, has the board chairman put any official statement to us here? Mr. Speaker, the board chair was appointed by the president. It's a public no, Don't confuse officer. the matter. Ask the simple question. You're quoting from something which is not before us and contrasting that with the minister's statement before us. And you're asking whether one of them is not telling the truth. But Mr. Chairman, we must, we must have something. Good Can I finish, please? We may have something to compare. So, I'm asking whether the board chairman's statement is before us in the house, upon which you can come to a conclusion one way or the other. Is that, is that before us, Mr. Speaker? Thank you. The board chair said this on Good Evening Ghana, in his capacity as a board chair. And now the minister is also giving us a different answer. So I'm just asking, how does he just oppose these two answers? And who is telling the truth? It is the who is telling the truth part which complicates the matter. Because if I have two statements, one is official lodged before us. One, you said you monitored it on Good Evening Ghana. Whether you are quoting specifically or not, I cannot verify so, anyway, Honorable Minister, are you aware of a statement made by your board chairman in respect of the same matter? Mr. Speaker, no. You may ask another question. What is the question? Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Granted, granted that what the minister, Honorable Minister is saying is true. What procurement method is used? Because whether it's rentals or purchases, it must still go through the access history of the Public Procurement Act. So which method did you use? Because this is specifically technical services. Which procurement method did you use to arrive at the companies that render that services to you? Thank you. Yes, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Th Mr. Speaker, like he said, there are rules governing hiring of different services. And Ghana Airport Company invited bidders. And upon that, this, those who rent those facilities, based on that, they selected one and they rented the facility from that. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I'm a bit confused. The minister said it was rentals, and so it was not purchased. Now he's saying that Ghana Airport Company invited two bids, and out of which one was engaged. I am saying that in your answer, you said there was no procurement. It was rentals. Yes. And now you are saying that Ghana Airport Company invited two bids, and out of which one was engaged. I'm a bit confused at this stage. Now, uh, Mr. Minister, are you aware that the Public Procurement Act when the threshold is 50,000, per your answer, DDP has paid 50,000 out of it. And when the threshold is above 50,000, you need to go through national competitive tendering. Please, did your ministry or Ghana Airport Company go through this stage, competitive tendering? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, yeah, Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me correct some impression.
and question is being created by the honourable member that I have said that there was no procurement process. I have never said that here. I haven't said that there wasn't any procurement process. So I just want to put that thing on record. The fact that we rented the facility did not mean that we didn't go through the procurement process. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But ask the main, uh, Honourable Minister, kindly answer the main question. The main question was that if the cost exceeded 50000 under the Procurement Act, you needed to go through national competitive bidding. So did you or did Ghana Airport Company go through national competitive bidding? Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm not aware that once the figure goes beyond 50,000, we need to, we can do selective tender. It is also competitive, it's also part of procurement process. Selective tender is also part of procurement process. So for him to say, unless, so unless... You're saying you did selective tender? Yes, we did selective tender. Okay. You are done. I'll go to, yes. You have asked three questions. <laughs> Very well, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think the minister is not helping matters. If you said you have gone through the procurement uh, method, procedure, the simple question I asked was, which method did you use? And if you are not able to tell the method... He just selective tendering. He just mentioned it. He just said selective tendering. So, Mr. Speaker, if you have engaged an amount of 128,366 and DDP has paid 50,000, you are left with almost about 78,366, which is above the treasury per the law. And so you need to go through the national competitive tendering. And so I'm asking the minister, did he go through this national competitive tendering to arrive at the, the, the vendors or those who are the company that is supposed to render that services to the company? And we have answered you. He said he doesn't agree with you that he has to only to go through only national competitive tendering. Selective tendering is also admitted, and they use selective tendering. So he's answered. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to find out from the minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to find out from the minister if um, whether he's aware the Ghana Airport Company conducted any cost-benefit analysis um, before they arrived at the decision to to rent these um, Christmas trees because I'm looking at the amount here in question it says 128,366 on rental so I want to find out from the minister did they do a cost-benefit analysis since Christmas is an is an annual event that occurs so between renting it for this amount every year and purchasing it outright. Um, I don't know if they did a cost benefit, if the minister is aware they did that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Minister, are you aware that they did a cost benefit analysis before concluding on renting? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I will. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I know that they took the bad decision for the institution. So at that time, it was a bad decision for them to rent it, and that's what they did. Thank you. Very well. Honorable Minister, thank you for attending upon the House to answer questions. You are discharged. Mr. Speaker, to take the chair.
I discharge the transport minister. Yes, Majority Chief. Speaker, at the commencement of public business, um, I guess we are ready to take item 7A. Speaker, I'll seek your leave to do it for and on behalf of the Leader of the House, with your leave. Yes, please. Mr. Speaker, we've already agreed on it. Honourable members, we take item 7 at the commencement of public business. The request is for us to take 7A, presentation of papers, the following papers to be presented, 7A, Roman 1, 2, and 3. We take them together. Yes, Majority Chief Whip. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Public Procurement Authority for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Coastal Development Authority for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Zongo Development Fund for the year 2021. Honorable members, the three Annual statements as captured in item 7A, Roman 1, Roman 2, the next one should be Roman 3, are all referred to the Public Accounts Committee. Is it the Public Accounts Committee? The Speaker, I thought because we said they are sectoral related, they should be referred to the various sector committees. Which sectors are these? The, these development authorities, and then the public procurement authority, then also Zungo Development Fund. Which sector is that? Could we refer them to the Committee on Social Welfare and State Enterprises? Yes, please. Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Speaker, uh, these are committees that committee of, these are work that Committee of Finance normally deals with. So the Finance, finance Committee. Yeah, yes, Mr. It's Speaker. Audit, audit the reports. Finance Committee deals with the Zongo Development Authority yes. and the uh, Public Procurement Authority and all of that. As part of as part of Office of Government Machinery. Yes, I want to get a sense of the house. Yes, BT Honorable BT Baba. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think the, your committee on poverty reduction strategy wow. has had engagement to the Coastal Development Authority. And we are also in touch with the National Development Planning Commission. It means that most of these things that you are making referrals has always not been referred to us as well. So I want to appeal to your office that my committee should be part of the referral. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Majority Chief. Speaker, I, I heard my colleague, but with respect in this House, unless we want to depart from the Convention, such works are always referred to the Finance Committee. So I, I, I couldn't have agreed more with the Minority Leader. It is for the Finance Committee. Yes, 
Hey, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the leadership of the Poverty Alviation Committee have expressed strong interest. And I think to, uh, to be prudent to allow the leadership of that committee to poverty, join the finance poverty committee. Reduction. Poverty reduction, I mean, to join the committee, the leadership. Honorable members, the three annual statements are referred to the Finance Committee and we encourage the leadership of the Poverty Reduction Committee to assist the Finance Committee in the consideration and report back to the House accordingly. Yes, any more guidance? Yes, Speaker. Speaker, may we turn to page six, still under public business, and take item 7E. Speaker, with your leave to be taken by the Deputy Minister of Finance. Item 7E, all of them. E I, E I, I, and I, I, I. Honorable members, seven. E, at basis of the order paper, Roman 1, Roman 2, Roman 3, to be taken together by the Deputy Minister for and on behalf of the Minister for Finance. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Ghana Exim Bank for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Ministry of Finance for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Office of the Head of Civil Service for the year 2021. Honorable members, the three annual statements are accordingly referred to the Committee on Finance for consideration and report to the House. Yes, please. Speaker, we are, we are ready now for 7H, and I will again seek your leave for it to be done by the Honorable Obi Amwa. Sorry, Speaker, I didn't get the number. You said? 7H. 7H. Yes. Speaker, we are taking all of it from I to XX by the Deputy Minister of Local Government. Honorable Members, item 7H, starting from Roman 1 to Roman 20. We we'll take them together, and the minister, no, now he's deputy minister, he's not a minister. Deputy minister at the Ministry of Local Government, Decentralization, and rural development, Honorable Obi Amwa, to do that for and on behalf of the Minister. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of Eastern Regional Coordinating Council for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Adentan Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Aloga District Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Busumi Freho District Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Asante Akim North Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Doma West District Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Manpo Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the New Draven South Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Century South District Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Nsanwom Edwajiri Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Kwewu West Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Frontier Aqua North District Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Adaklu District Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Kwaibibrim Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. 
Annual Statement by the Audit Committee of the Lower Manya Krovo Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual Statement by the Audit Committee of the Yilo Krovo Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual Statement by the Audit Committee of the Obwasi Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual Statement by the Audit Committee of the North Tongu District Assembly for the year 2021. Annual Statement by the Audit Committee of the Ministry of Local Government, Decentralization and Rural Development for the year 2021. Annual Statement by the Audit Committee of the Birim North District Assembly for the year 2021. Honorable members, all the annual statements as detailed out in item 7H, 20 in number, are referred to the Committee on Local Government and Rural Development for consideration and report to the House. Yes, please. Speaker. Speaker 7I. And I will seek again your kind leave for it to be taken by the noble Matthew Poku Prempe, the Minister for Energy. Say the Minister for. The Minister for Energy. I thought it was education. With respect, that's why I sought your leave for it to be taken by the Minister for Energy. He knows I won't allow him to lay it. He knows. Yeah. He knows that I won't allow him to lay it. So that we're seeking your kind leave. Yeah, but I will refuse that uh, permission. He knows. So that we, 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 will, we will... This is father and son matter. Don't go in. that we will do the need for. <laughs> Why? Are you pleading for and on his behalf? Yes, indeed. Are you a Catholic? There is a process we go through if you are a Catholic, you understand that. But I know you are a Christian. He's a Christian. He's a good man. <laughs> Honorable members, item 7i at page 8, we are being asked to allow the Minister for Energy to present this annual statement for on behalf of the Minister for Education. Roman 1 to Roman 14. Please, Minister, you may do so now. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the McCoy College of Education for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the University of Energy and Natural Resources for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Ola College of Education, Cape Coast, for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Ghana Communication Technology University for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Coporidia Technical University for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the St. Joseph's College of Education, Bichem, for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the National Film and Television Institution for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Mampom Technical College of Education for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Ghana Institute of Journalism for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the St. Ambrose College of Education, Doma Akwemu, for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Pekki College of Education for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the EP College of Education, Amezofe, for the year 2021. 
annual statement by the audit committee of the Tafradi Technical University for the year 2021, annual statement by the audit committee of the Dambai College of Education for the year 2021. Honorable members, all the annual statements are detailed out under item 7i, 14 in number are referred to the Committee on Education for consideration and report to the House. Yes, Majority Chief Whip. Speaker, as discussed, um, we are ready to take item 19 on page 19 of today's order paper. And speaker, yes. the, the chair of the committee, the majority leader, has granted me the leave to take it, and I'll seek your kind leave to take the motion. Honorable members, item 19, at page 19 of the order paper, motion, chairman of the committee, I grant permission to the majority chief whip to do so for and on behalf of the chairman of the committee. Yes, please. Speaker, with respect, I rise to move that this honorable house adopts the report of the Special Budget Committee on the Draft Public Elections Registration of Voters Regulation 2022 and other related matters. The speaker, in so doing, I present the committee's report, and I intend to limit myself to just some portions and invite Hansai to do the needful. Speaker, the Special Budget Committee held a briefing session on Wednesday, 27 July 2022, with the Electoral Commission of Ghana, led by the chairperson and the two deputies involved. Speaker, the Subsidiary Legislation Committee of Parliament had earlier held a pre laying meeting with the EC to review a new CI, Public Elections Registration of Voters, Regulation 2022, and other related matters that the Commission is contemplating seeking the approval of Parliament to replace the existing instruments in preparation towards election 2024. Speaker, the committee having thoroughly interrogated the issues and reforms being contemplated by the EC would like to reiterate its support for any efforts that will enable every Ghanaian to get a Ghana card because it tests the law. So that some committee members express their strong opinion that the new CI will give very limited options as many eligible voters may not be captured on the electoral roll and the time for the impending elections as access to the card has increasingly become a difficult enterprise for many Ghanaians. This situation, Speaker, the members observed, could lead to challenges where many eligible voters which obviously will be offensive to Article 42 of the Constitution. Speaker, in conclusion, the committee therefore respectfully recommends to the House, in view of the foregoing, to adopt this report on the draft CI, Public Elections, Registration of Voters Regulation 2022, and other related matters of the Electoral Commission of Ghana and subject it to further consideration by the House. Speaker, I so present. I thank you. Any second? Yes. Uh, speaker, I rise, rise to second the motion for the adoption of the report of the Committee on Special Budget on what ordinarily Mr. Speaker should raise eyebrows, a briefing session on the draft public elections registration of voters regulation 2022. 
We are speaking as you are aware. Any regulation that comes to this house works on the strength of Article 11 of the 1992 Constitution. And with your indulgence, Mr. Speaker, I beg to quote, uh, Honorable, your, your Constitution. I beg to quote Article 11, uh, which provides, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, for the record, I, I, I quote. The laws of Ghana shall comprise of, so Mr. Speaker, yourself a good lawyer. It, uh, uh, yes, but it, it, it stipulates the hierarchy of the laws in terms of their importance and superiority. So Article 11 7 provides that any order, rule, or regulation made by a person or authority under a power conferred by the Constitution or any other law shall be laid before Parliament published in the Gazette on the day it is laid before Parliament and come into force at the expiration of 21 sitting days. So, Mr. Speaker, ordinarily, any report on a draft CI ought to belong to the mandate and remit of the subsidiary legislation committee ably chaired by Dr. Ayene. But, Mr. Speaker, in this particular regulation, the Electoral Commission, by virtue of, and again, I refer you to Article 45 and 46 of the 1992 Constitution, the Electoral Commission has the mandate to do what it sought to do. So, Article 45, the Electoral Commission shall have the following functions. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, they have a duty to undertake programs for the expansion of the registration of voters. I'm quoting 45E in particular for our purpose. So, Mr. Speaker, when the EC introduced this particular regulation, two important observations was made by the Committee of Special Budget. One, the Electoral Commission was now informing the Ghanaian public through Parliament that only the national ID card issued by the National Identification Authority will be a sole reference document for the purpose of registration. Mr. Speaker, that is the intent of what is referred to as a draft CI. And in it, if you want, I'll refer to the particular uh, purpose. It says qualification for registration. And then it comes, Mr. Speaker, again to say two, designation of registration centers. And again, Mr. Speaker, our committee found problems with the designation of the registration center. It says a district office of the commission, a district office of the commission, or any other place that the commission considers appropriate. Mr. Speaker, throughout history in 1993, since the establishment of the Electoral Commission, voter registration exercise is done at polling stations, polling stations, not district offices. And Mr. Speaker, I'll use the example of Bole. A polling station in the Bole constituency is as far as spending four or five hours to get to Bole Township in order to be able to be captured and registered as a voter. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, maybe the Honorable UC will give me the name of the community where they have to travel very far. Babato in, in the Bole district. So, Mr. Speaker, you have to travel almost 80 kilometers to travel. So for the Electoral Commission to designate only district officers is problematic for us constitutionally, is problematic for us administratively, is problematic for us for voters to identify. Mr. Speaker, when the opportunity was given to voters to go and register at police station, it serves two purposes. One, they know where to go and verify their names. And two, they know where to appear on election day to be able to cast their vote. Now, limiting it only to a district office will deny Ghanaians this opportunity, which can also amount to an attempt to deny them a constitutionally guaranteed right under Article 42. So, Mr. Speaker, may I now refer you to Article 42, which will be the trust of my argument as to why the Electoral Commission must clean up before even they submit whatever official document they have to the subsidiary legislation committee. Because, Mr. Speaker, we are committed to a democracy. 
as you yourself observed yesterday, the conduct of elections and change of government is not enough. The independence of the Electoral Commission as a referee is important. Mr. Speaker, I come to 42. It reads, and I quote, Article 42 reads, Every citizen of Ghana of 18 years of age or above and of sound mind has a right to vote. And Mr. Speaker, the emphasis now is mine and is entitled to be registered as a voter for the purpose of public elections and referendum. Mr. Speaker, so Article 42 imposes an onerous obligation on the Electoral Commission to provide an opportunity to every Ghanaian so qualified without any inhibition, without any hindrance to be able to consummate the right constitutionally guaranteed under Article 42. May I speak up for the record, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, Ghanaians who have attained the age of 18 years have been denied the opportunity to be captured as registered voters. This is a constitutional wrong. Let anybody challenge me with facts and figures, Mr. Speaker. There has been no voter register opportunity for Ghanaians who have attained 18 years since 2021. That is a constitutional wrong unacceptable to a country committed to multi-party constitutional democracy. Mr. Speaker, the right to vote and to be voted for is so sacred. Even for you elected members of parliament, one of the minimum qualifications of you to get voted as MPs is to show that you are a registered voter. That is the weight the Constitution imposes on this in Article 94 of the Constitution. So, Mr. Speaker, the Electoral Commission, by virtue of their existing CI, have no reason to tell anybody and to tell this August House why they have so failed to capture Ghanaians who have attained 18 years. So, Mr. Speaker, we have a problem with it. One would have expected that the Electoral Commission will make a formal announcement. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, if this country is committed to mainstreaming IT in our public national life, it should be a matter of daily occurrence that anybody who attains 18 can voluntarily walk to any office of the Electoral Commission to be captured as a registered voter. That is what we should do. And Mr. Speaker, when you are given direction on this matter, it should be part of your consequential direction. Why? Ghana, IT, enabled uh, 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 country. And you are saying that when I'm 18, the EC have denied me an opportunity to get to register. So Mr. Speaker, if there were elections in 2021, maybe a by-election, 2022, 2023, this category of Ghanaians would have been denied a legitimately guaranteed sacred constitutional right to register as a voter and to be voted for as required in Article 42. So, Mr. Speaker, this is another constitutional ill that we said that the EC must correct. And, Mr. Speaker, today there is no law, no law, that prohibits the Electoral Commission from going ahead to conduct voter registration exercise for Ghanaians who have attained 18. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, in my travel, and I'm sure you also, you've also come across it, I was in Colorado with you. There are some Ghanaians abroad who also want the opportunity to come home to be registered as voters. They only can do so if they are guaranteed this particular right. So, Mr. Speaker, when you say draft regulation, by virtue of the Supreme Court ruling, the Subsidiary Legislation Committee, as I said, ably chaired by Dr. Ayene, is mindful that they cannot alter, they cannot alter any instrument or regulation brought before them, because that may render it a nullity on the basis of the earlier Supreme Court ruling on the matter. So, Mr. Speaker, when the EC submitted same to his committee, he consulted, and in his consultation, one, why does the EC want to register registration of voters to a district office? That is wrong and unacceptable, and we should not accept it. It must be at polling centers, demarcated for purposes of registration of voters 
and for purposes of casting their vote. So, Mr. Speaker, we are arguing that if you look at the current CI, Electoral Commission CI 91, there is nothing wrong with it. The EC can go ahead. Mr. Speaker, let me conclude so that Dr. Ayano will do justice to it. My final comment, Mr. Speaker, is that we should be interested in the wording in the Constitution. National Identification Authority is a creature of an Act of Parliament. So under Article 11, it cannot be superior to the Electoral Commission so established under Article 45. So Mr. Speaker, may I refer you back once I conclude to Article 46 of the uh, Electoral Com uh, Constitution. It reads, and I quote, except as provided in this constitution or any other law not inconsistent with this constitution. Mr. Speaker, the emphasis is mine. In the performance of its functions, the Electoral Commission shall not be subject to the direction or control of any person or authority. We cannot say the same for the National Identification Authority which is under the control and oversight of the able minister for interior. So, Mr. Speaker, data from National Identification Authority cannot be treated as if it's data from the Electoral Commission of Ghana, even though materially I agree that the Electoral Commission can drive a source of data from the National Identification Authority. But because ministerial oversight, and I've seen a letter of President Nanao Dudankwa, uh, 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 to this house saying that the Honorable Minister for Interior is responsible to the National Identification Authority. So the Minister for Interior can direct the National Identification Authority. We do not want an instance where he will direct in a matter where he has interest. Because he himself runs for Parliament. And he will support Nana Dudankwa for Parliament. So Mr. Speaker, the 18 year old in Ghana, 19, 20, 21 years, who want to vote President Akufuado out have been denied the opportunity to be captured in the voter register for the purpose of future elections. They want to. So we are saying that, Mr. Speaker, make a clear distinction between an institution so established by an Act of Parliament, which has control, ministerial oversight and control, by the Minister for Interior, and separate and distinct from the Electoral Commission established under Article 45 and 46, which shall not be subject to the direction and control of any person or authority. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, in the NRA Act, some mandate is given to the minister responsible. It didn't mention interior, though. It didn't mention interior. So, Mr. Speaker, draft, why are we debating a draft? Because, Mr. Speaker, we want to reach a consensus guided by you as to how to proceed with the EC wanting to exercise a legitimate mandate. Nobody is questioning the authority and mandate of the Electoral Commission. But we are questioning that they cannot say that, the Electoral Commission cannot say that only district offices must be dedicated for purpose of registration. That is wrong. It must be polling centers. And this parliament must provide enough budgetary allocations. Honorable Minister of Finance, good to see you. The Electoral Commission has even paid people they use for the conduct of 2020 elections. Go and do what is right and appropriate for them and give them money to dispense of those expenses. And assure them, democracy is expensive, but at least it's better where you have no rights or freedoms and you have no system working at all. So, Mr. Speaker, I have with me here the NIA Act of 2006, Act 706. And then, Mr. Speaker, as I said, it provides that the minister, the minister in, in, in sec, uh, section 18, referring to now the minister for the interior. So therefore, Mr. Speaker, our primary concern is now data. The NIA has data. Electoral Commission has data. The Electoral Commission spent $80 million dollars to undertake an exercise for the purpose of voter registration. Where is that data? And what is wrong with that data? If you so wanted to rely on NIA, 
why didn't you allow the state to allocate the 80 million dollars to the national identification authority but you said mr speaker hansard will capture me the electoral commission appeared before this house and said that they have a superior technology and that even eyelashes will be captured we don't see that even in the register that they so have so where is your register we need to know then mr speaker the government of my issue is reconciliation of data currently the electoral commission has about 16 million on its voter register the nia has less oh now ahmed help me with the numbers there Mr. Speaker, the report speaks to it. I will, but I want to quote a particular figure. So, Mr. Speaker, there is a discrepancy between what the NIA have. No, 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 no. There is a discrepancy in the figure of. Uh... Mr. Speaker, we have voter register, 17 million. Then NIA, 16. Point six million. That discrepancy can occasion an opportunity of denial of the legitimate right guaranteed under Article 42. Mr. Speaker, we saw it when it came to SIM registration. They said no NIA, no SIM registration, blackout. You cannot do a blackout to a registered voter on the basis that he has no national ID card. This is what we are seeking to avoid. So on election day, you go to your police station and you are told that because you have no NIA, you can't be on the electoral roll. Mr. Speaker, that would be a constitutional wrong. That would be a constitutional wrong. So until, Mr. Speaker, the discrepancy is resolved between the NIA and the electoral commission that we are setting. And Mr. Speaker, in some regions, in some regions, particularly the Upper West region, your own region, and Volta region, the number of persons captured by NIA is far low than what is captured by the Electoral Commission on their voter register. We don't want to believe that this may be deliberate to disenfranchise people in areas deemed dominant for the National Democratic Congress. So, Mr. Speaker, we jealously, jealously will protect the right to vote. That is why, Mr. Speaker, we said that there must be a meeting of the Committee of the Whole where the Electoral Commission and the NIA share their data with us and assure us that we can rely on their data so that the National Identification Authority becomes the sole document. Now, Mr. Speaker, why is that easy? Why is that easy not making their own data the register you capture with $80 million, how come that a person on that register cannot guarantee a voter for the purpose of registration of vote? Then what exercise did you undertake? You took, you took $80 million to register Ghanaian. You are now saying national ID card, not even a voter register issued by the Electoral Commission. Yet you, you issued the card. So, Mr. Speaker, in other jurisdictions, they have relied on the guarantor system. They are also refusing the guarantee system. Yes, Just a minute. Thank you, I, Mr. Speaker. I see. I, I have not. Have you concluded? You have concluded. Yes. Honorable Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, following the arguments my Honorable Member for Tamale South is making, stating on this floor, that because the NIA has a lesser number in Volta region than the National Ele Electoral Commission registered numbers in both Volta region and Upper West region, it presupposes that NIA is trying to disenfranchise people because those are regions, those are regions, those are regions, to make it worse, those are regions that are predominantly NBC. Mr. Speaker, what is his basis for that? Mr. Speaker, it's a very dangerous statement. The immediate past, the immediate past, the immediate past minority leader is making. The fact that you have moved from minority leader to senior member of the opposition 
doesn't mean you make statements without substantiating. I do sympathize with how you have been moved. But if you are making arguments now, the arguments must be grounded. The arguments that can cause problems outside this chamber should not be tolerated. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, he goes on to say, he goes on to say that between 2018 and 2020 up to now, nobody 18 years has been registered. Palpable falsity. Palpable falsity. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we should all, we should all collaborate. I do, I do accept it. We should all collaborate to make sure that the EC, when it lays a CI, has the support of both sides of the house so that we can engender peace in this country. But the arguments that my honorable former minority leader and a friend of this, uh, of the special budget committee is making is very, very dangerous. We should not make the work of electoral commission and national identification commission partisan such that we make arguments. Did you hear him? Yes. So that such that it will cause problems for me and him outside here. I'm, I'm pleading with them. I, I thought I thought we had rules. Honourable Minister, please. Honourable Minister, I thought you were raising a point of order. Yeah, I was raising a, a point. Yes. I was raising a point, Mr. Speaker. I stood for three minutes. I stood for I stood for three minutes before I caught your eye. Yes. And I was quiet. You see, that gesticulation for my honourable colleague must not be allowed in this house. Address me. Address me. Mr. Speaker. I, I would not attempt to even direct you to look in the direction of my very good friend. Oh, Mr. Speaker, it is not nice. It is not parliamentary for somebody to catch the eye of the speaker, to be given the floor to speak, for colleagues to be jumping up and down their seats as if we are in the market. Mr. Speaker, I learned, I learned parliamentary practice for the best, which includes Mr. Speaker and Minority Leader. Never, never in this house did I speak Mr. Speaker, when he was minority leader or a member, jumping out there, up and down his chair. He doesn't behave like that. Learn, learn. Learn. You are disgracing the speaker. Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to say that. Uh, just a minute, just a minute. Honorable members, I taught the purpose of this exercise is to get the House to build consensus and to get agencies on the S. Whether the Constitution says they are independent or not independent, we approve their budget, we do everything, and we have to hold them to account to the good people of Ghana. There's a serious challenge we want to build consensus and see how we can work with them to resolve the issue so that we get all qualified Ghanaians to enjoy they are fundamental human rights guaranteed by the Constitution. So please, let's take that as the uppermost, the reason why we are doing this, and don't be seen to rather be aggravating the situation. So I've heard your point of order. I will allow the honorable member for he said I should allow him a few seconds. Yes, please. Mr. Speaker, you know, in, con he in one, conclusion. One I know he can use one second. But Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, current voter register of the Electoral Commission is 17,041,340. Mr. Speaker, then uh, current total registered Ghanaians by the National Identification Authority is sixteen million seven hundred and fifty four thousand seventy three. Out of this thirteen thousand thirteen million three hundred and seventeen cars have been issued, leaving three point four million Ghanaians without the Ghana card. How can we ensure that this category of Ghanaians legitimately enjoy the full benefits of the rights guaranteed them under Article 42 of the Constitution. It is my 
submission honorable, honorable, that the NIA honorable, have no excuse the, with the CIA minister, to run a one two six not to proceed yes, with a momentary voter register. Thank you, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Yes, a minute. The Minister for Interior is up on his feet. Yes. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think we all look forward to resolving these matters in the uh, Committee of the Whole. But as of today, as of today I want to update the uh, Honorable Haruna Ijisu that as at 21st February 2023, the number of citizens registered is 17,381,951. Well, well, there will be an opportunity for us to reconcile that in the Committee of the Whole. But I need to tell you that. That's what. Honourable members, please, the minister was just trying to update the figure. But I know... I know that when you have the Committee of the Whole, you will discuss all these things. Please, let's find a solution to the challenge. Don't let's aggravate the situation. I take it that the Honorable Member has concluded his submission. Honorable Haruna Idrisu, you concluded. Now, please, you, I have a list. I'm guided by the list, and I'm going according to the list. Leadership. Mr. Speaker, the report I have, and the page shows the report which was given to us honorable, honorable, for honorable, purposes of this honorable report. Honorable Haruna, I haven't given you the opportunity. I will not, I will not allow anybody to impute your integrity. No, 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 no. no. The fact that the, even the dates and the date you gave is different. He was giving us the latest. And so that cannot be imputing your integrity. Um, we will now listen to Honorable Obi Amwa. That's the list I have. Honorable Obi Amwa. Uh, Honorable Deputy Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, um, yes, you, you would speak, but we ferry the message across to you. Mr. Speaker, we ferry the message across to you, and it's on the grounds of that message that I'm on my feet. Mr. Speaker, my, our position from the majority friend bench is that when our colleagues in the minority front bench are on their feet, or any other colleague from the minority side is on his feet, Mr. Speaker, our side accord that honorable member that respect. Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, what we witnessed a moment ago, when Honorable Aaron Idris was making his constitutional argument, the whole parliament, this chamber was quiet. We may have disagreement, but we would wait for him to finish. But when Honorable Matthew Poku Prempe got up to make an intervention, on the point of order, Mr. Speaker, we saw, we heard, and Mr. Speaker, I would want to plead that going forward, some of these things should not be happening. We should, we should, Mr. Speaker, tolerate each other and allow debate to flow. The way, Mr. Speaker, our colleagues, Mr. Speaker, this is an example. Even now, they are not patient enough. <laughs> so, because, uh, it appears that even, even when we are protesting for a possible change, they are not ready. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, 
we've made our point. Honourable Member, I, I was listening to you. I haven't granted anybody any opportunity. I was listening to you. You were addressing me. So please. Speaker, when you were the majority leader, I recall you used this phrase, reckless heckling. You said re he heckling is allowed. But yes. when that heckling becomes reckless, it's unparliamentary. Yes. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> I, yeah, I, Mr. Speaker, that phrase, there was a debate. And the heckling was getting out of hand. And you got up to say that heckling is part of politics. The parliament we have, heckling is allowed. But when it becomes reckless, it's, 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 it's unacceptable. Mr. Speaker, all I am saying is that even at the bar, we do some little heckling. In this chamber, there can be some minimum heckling. But Mr. Speaker, it shouldn't get to the stage where you would describe it as reckless heckling. That is the point I want to make. And Mr. Speaker, if that continues, things will get out of hand. So I would plead with colleagues, Mr. Speaker, I will plead with colleagues that the way we accord Honorable Atu Fawcett with respect, they should accord our side with the same respect. The way we accorded the former minority leader with respect, they should do the same thing to us. What is happening is getting out of hand, taking advantage of the liberties of opposition to always have your way. It's not the way for democracy to try. Mr. Speaker, you see? Mr. Speaker, you see? I don't want to mention names. You see? Instead of them to listen in silence, instead of them to listen in silence, instead of them to listen in silence, they have a problem. Mr. Speaker, I rest my case. Honorable members, you know we started the process of renewing our mandates here in Parliament. If I have to apply the rules, it could disqualify some of you before you get to your constituencies. That's why sometimes we desist from going that far. So don't take advantage of our magnanimity and be rubbing in. So please, let's allow, let's listen to each other. Let's, at the end of the day, achieve what this whole exercise is about. Add an extensive discussion with the leadership of the House. The majority leader was with me yesterday. He gave me a brief. This morning, a minority were with me. They gave me a brief. At our pre-sitting meeting, we went through this again, and we decided to take these two motions. This is the first one. Share these ideas before we get into the Committee of the Whole. Then the Committee of the Whole will now report back to the House for us to see whether we could allow the CI to be laid we are also looking at the timing. There are other issues we have to consider as a house. So please, can we listen to each other? If you decide not to do so, I will take the position that I'll apply the law, and I'm sure some of you cannot get to your constituencies after that. Well, your constituents will not vote for you at all. The, the statement that the, 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 the speaker will issue will disqualify you. So please, let's listen to uh, Honorable Obi Amwa. I have the list, so I'll come back. You give me five from each side. Five from each side. So the two motions, that is ten from each side. And we need to have time. In the meantime, I'll have to extend certain look at the nature of business under our standard orders. So sitting is extended beyond the prescribed 
sitting time. Please, it's now the turn of the majority caucus, and we'll have to listen to Honorable O.B. Amwa. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I rise to comment on the report of the Special Budget Committee on the briefing session on the draft public elections regulations. Mr. Speaker, this situation appears to be very unprecedented. And as we learn every day, it will enrich our democracy. Indeed, if we look at the Constitution under Article 11.7, it talks about the procedure for laying of instruments before Parliament. Somewhere along the line, I remember very well, before I even became chairman of the Social Legislation Committee, it was agreed that we as stakeholders should also be consulted. That is how come the pre-laying procedure came into being. Otherwise, the relevant agency would have to come and lay the instrument, it's referred to the committee, the committee brings its report, and if two thirds of members of parliament don't reject the instrument, it becomes a law. By bringing the pre laying we have been consulted as to the kind of regulations any institution wants to lay. The EC, in following the new procedure, appeared before the Central Legislation Committee as to the kind of instrument they intended to lay before Parliament. At the meeting, several issues came up. The main issue was the fact that the EC wanted to bring this constitutional instrument, which would then promote continuous registration. Indeed, even at that meeting, some members were saying that their interpretation of the CI was that the EC was compiling a new register, which the EC denied. Indeed, the then minority leader had even granted interview to the whole world that the EC was compiling a new register, and that EC had spent 80 million to compile a new register. At the meeting, and scrutinizing the CI, the EC was not compiling a new register. The EC was seeking to register those who had turned 18, and that through continuous registration, we could walk in to the district office any time to get registered. Now, reading the report, and then coming to the conclusion of the committee, the first thing is that no new register will be compiled. Secondly, we also have to acknowledge that no CI has been laid. Because we hear the public, we hear even some of our members telling the whole world that a CI has been laid. And that CI it will seek to stop people from getting registered. No CI has been laid. Three, at the meeting, and if, even if you look at this report, we seem to acknowledge that the guarantor system has been abused. And indeed, as practitioners, even as practitioners, the thought behind the guarantor system was to acknowledge that where a prospective registrant did not have any means of identification. They could fall on their parents, 
their spouses, their children, close family members, to guarantee and sign a form that indeed I know this person is qualified to be registered. And that, as we have moved on along the years, this system has been abused in the sense that people overnight became guarantee contractors, where they join the queue, get registered, they stand by and say that they are waiting to endorse 10 or 5 people that they know them, they should be registered. It's a worry which we must take into consideration. And indeed, if for any reason the guarantee system has been maintained, all these issues must be addressed. And in the CI that the NC wants to propose. But that is not even the issue at this stage. If you look at the report, it's first Deputy Speaker to take the chair. If we read the report, the various paragraphs, starting from page 3, last by one paragraph. Even at the committee level, and Mr. Speaker, I will read the paragraph. It says, the committee further sought to know what has happened to the EC's biometric data that was recently collated and the voters' ID cards that were issued by the Commission for the 2020 elections. In other words, the committee wanted to know or wanted to understand why the recent voters' ID cards may not qualify to be used for the purposes of registration, but rather the NIA card. Mr. Speaker, this concern, this issue has been answered further. But it shows that even for members of parliament, some are still carrying that opinion that the new CI is to ensure that the EC carries out new registration. That is not so. That is not so. And finding it here means that our own members have not taken their trouble to even know what is in the proposed CI. Further, Mr. Speaker, if you go to page four, In the response of the EC, if you look at II of the report, page 4, I want to read with the speaker. It says, the chairperson explained for the records that officially no CI has been presented to Parliament as is being alleged. However, as has been the convention and practice of the House, the Commission engage the Subject Legislation Committee to solicit the inputs of the members and to enrich the draft CI as part of the processes before it is finally presented to the House. The next page. On the use of the Ghana card, the chairperson explained that indeed we used to have various forms of identity and that even for the last registration, where we all got registered. Every member here got registered. Otherwise, we couldn't have even stood as a member of parliament. We all have that registration card, the voter ID card. And for that purpose, all the rules were applied. Going forward, the EC is saying that, indeed, if we cannot stop the abuse of the guarantee system, then we should rather rely on the Ghana card to be able to register. Now, I can see from the report that the committee on page 7 was assured in the words of the committee, in the strongest terms by the chairperson that no new register will be compiled. The issue then is how do we address what has been provided before the Special Budget Committee? I would want to say that if you look at the last paragraph of the report, 
He says the committee is recommending to the House that in view of the foregoing, to adopt the report on the draft CI. But, Mr. Speaker, indeed, there's no CI before us. That should be on record. It should, it should be put on record that no CI is before us for the committee to recommend on the draft CI. The reality is that we are at the consultation stage. And at the consultation stage, most often, the EC or any institution consulting us takes on board some of the suggestions that we make. And then I believe that even if they're suggesting that instead of the district offices, we should EC should create more centers for persons to be registered. It's a fantastic idea. And we, in the consequences, we know the implications of that. Of course, a district office is at one place, but where people will come from to come and register may be far from the district office. In which case, satellite offices can be created. And I don't see this as a major issue that we think that because of this, the EC should not be allowed to leave ECI. I don't see this as a major issue. And as I said, Mr. Speaker, this is unprecedented because we hear our colleagues saying that they will not allow the EC to lay the CI. It's a very dangerous statement for anybody to make. Does it mean that, does it mean that for now, any institution which wants to bring this CI to this house, if we don't agree to the CI, they will not let the CI be laid. The rules, the constitution provides that if a CI is laid, it's, it's referred to the committee in charge of that particular instrument. And if the committee even is not in favor of that CI being laid, it is reports to us here. And if two tests, we should read that, is it the constitution? If two tests are able to reject that CI, that is the end of the matter. If two tests are not able to reject it, the CI is passed. Anybody who is not happy with this situation would have to go to court. You we'll go to the Supreme Court to challenge why that instrument should not stand. And since July, we appear to be creating a person to the world that the EC will not be allowed to lay its instrument in this house. We should not change that part. Honorable. That part will not help us. Honorable Minister. That Honorable part will create chaos. Mr. Speaker, to take the chair. <laughs> Honorable Obi Amwa. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. He is not members of parliament who allow a CI or an LI or a paper or petition to be laid in the house. He's not members of parliament. He's a speaker. Yes. Why you be referring to this, there's history to it. 1994, I was a chairman of the subsidiary legislation committee. Because of the nature of the constitutional provision, I led the House to reject an ally presented by the Minister of Trade and Industry. That is where it started. I started looking at pre-laying discussions with stakeholders. That's 1994. Since then, it has never happened again. I was the chairman in 1994. The first chairman was the Honorable Kobia, Francis Kobia. A few months he was made a minister. Then Honorable Cletus Avoka took over. A few months he was made a deputy minister. Then I took over. That is what happened. That is why we decided to do the pre-laying consultations. This one is quite extensive now. We have expanded the frontiers. And please, the public is so much interested in this matter that we have to guide them to understand what is happening so that at the end of the day, they accept 
the decision not only of the house but of the state institutions so that we can have a credible peaceful elections in this country it's a very important instrument a very important subject matter so i expect us to have some cool heads in this matter please you may continue thank you mr speaker i agree with you perfectly and you have stated it here that you are the only one who can allow an instrument to be laid. You have stated it here. I'm saying that some members, some of our members, go on air, go everywhere to say, make such statements. And it's a very dangerous thing to do that we will not allow the CI to be laid because we don't like what the EC wants to do. That's the point I'm making, Mr. Speaker. That's the point I'm making. That that thing should not be allowed, should not be countenance. That persons can go out and members of parliament, indeed, can just sit on there and say that we will not allow the CIA to be laid. It's a very dangerous precedent. And you have clarified the situation. And I'm saying that as chairman of the Central Legislation Committee, we were in 94, I was chairman from 2013. And we allowed pre laying because it's helped us a lot. Otherwise, it's laid, there's a flaw, and we will get it. It has to be withdrawn. And we've seen some in this. When Honorable was the minority leader, he was the majority leader, he had to well, he had to draw a CI in this house because it was flawed. Just to give the history to it, the most critical thing now is that part of the budget committee, the budget committee was special budget committee wants to be assured that, one, the NIA sufficient funds to be able to complete the exercise as far as the Ghana card is concerned, so that the electoral commission also register persons mainly with the Ghana card. I would want to say that given the issues which have been raised in this report, the two institutions as they appear before us, the committee of the whole, some of these issues will come up. But that conception should not be countenanced. That indeed, we have any power authority, especially as members of the floor, to reject, not reject, to prevent the CI from being laid. So I speak of these few words. I want to commend the Special Budget Committee for the thorough work that they've done and for the attempts they are making to have this matter resolved. Because as we heard from Munabu uh, Haruna, my good friend, um, immediate past minority leader, immediate past minority leader. Uh, Okay, okay, I am outgoing senior deputy minister. <laughs> I'm outgoing. As we heard from Honorable Haruna, the registration process is being delayed because of this so called log jam. The EC wants to have a new CI so that those who have attained the age of 18 or never registered, could be registered. At the end of this year, there will be this level elections. And we are expected to address these issues so that a CI will be laid. It goes to the 21 sitting days. If two thirds of members don't reject, it becomes a law. Then we move on. As you said, I think that we should all agree to find a solution to this issue. But we should not stampede the EC or threaten the EC that we want to have our way when indeed the law and the constitution doesn't give us that authority. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, let's now listen to Honorable Eric Opoku. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute to the motion before this house. 
Mr. Speaker, as earlier speakers have already alluded to, there is no constitutional instrument before this House. But the Electoral Commission some time ago engaged the Subsidiary Legislation Committee. And Mr. Speaker, I am a member of the committee uh, in a pre laying meeting. Mr. Speaker, in that meeting, we discuss the draft constitutional instrument. And a number of issues came out from that discussion. The major issue that came up has to do with the intention of the Electoral Commission to use the Ghana card as the only means of identification for eligible Ghanaian citizens to have their names on the electoral roll. Mr. Speaker, we asked a number of persons, including whether the Electoral Commission can provide evidence in respect of the number of Ghanaians who have access to the NIA card. Mr. Speaker, as the report rightly captures, the EC indicated that from the NIA, 16,654,000 Ghanaians have been registered. But 3.3 million Ghanaians who have registered have not been issued a card. And Mr. Speaker, they indicated to us that out of the 16 million they are talking about, some of them are non-citizens. And some of them are minors. They have not attained the voting age of 18. So the 16 million figure that they gave us included all those people. And that is rightly captured in this report. Mr. Speaker, then we, those Ghanaians who have attained the age, uh, the voting age, if all of them are not having the national identification card, and you use that as the only means for qualification, then is it not a way of denying eligible Ghanaians, some eligible Ghanaians, their right to vote in this country? That was the bone of contention. And after the meeting, whatever transpired was communicated to leadership of this House. It was based on this that the Business Committee referred this matter to the Special Budget Committee for them to clarify the matters, to assuage the fears of members of Parliament as well as the Ghanaian public. And Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to note that this report before us it's a fair report. Mr. Speaker, it's a careful and well thought out report that reflects the sentiments of all of us here in Assembly. And Mr. Speaker, indeed the conclusions are logic. The conclusions are also fair. And I want to, I want to highlight an important point made in the conclusion. That probably settles the matter. Mr. Speaker, the report says that, conclusion on page 11, I read, however, the committee would like to stress that it will not accept and will reject any effort that is geared towards making the EC use the Ghana card as the only medium to qualify a person who is eligible to vote in 2024 elections. So the report signed by the leader of the House, the Minister for Parliamentary Affairs, is saying that they will never accept any arrangement and they will reject by whatever means any attempt by the EC to use only the Ghana card as a means of qualifying eligible Ghanaian citizens to vote in this country. Mr. Speaker, that is the issue that we have been raising. And so, after adopting the, the report, this becomes the position of this House. The Parliament of Ghana is saying that, Electoral Commission, we will not allow you to provide a law that says that only the Ghana card can be used to qualify eligible Ghanaian citizens to have their names on the electoral rule.
Mr. Speaker, this is what we have been looking for. And that is why I described the report as a fair report. Mr. Speaker, when you read the report, the EC indicated that this act decision was taken based on assurance that the EC had from the NIA that by the time we get to 2024, they would have captured a sizable percentage of the voting population. But when you go further, the report says that the, com the committee discussed with the EC what transpired at a meeting held between the Constitutional Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee and the NIA. In that meeting, the NIA highlighted a number of challenges hindering their ability to discharge the mandate bestowed on them. One of the challenges highlighted in the report has to do with budgetary constraints. And then they also talk about lack of offices and registration centers. The NIA is also talking about inaccessible network in some parts of the country. They are also talking about lack of power supply in many areas. They also talk about bad road networks. And Mr. Speaker, most importantly, they talk about travel distances. Travel distances. People have to travel to the centers from far away places. And the cost involved in some cases is unbearable. They talk about lack of basic equipment and then vehicles. Vehicles, they don't have vehicles for their staff to even travel to where the people are located. So due to these challenges, the NIA is unable to speed up the processes of getting everybody enrolled on the National Education Card. And that is the reason why uh, everybody who has the right to vote is not yet in possession of the card. It is for this reason that the committee, the special budget committee, reporting to this house that in order not to disenfranchise any Ghanaian in the 2024 elections, the electoral commission will not be allowed, the electoral commission will not be allowed to pass any law, to cause any law to be passed in this country that will use only the Ghana card as the means for identifying qualified citizens to have their names on the roll. Mr. Speaker, this uh, is... Uh, Honourable Member, before you go on, the Electoral Commission doesn't pass laws. It's this House. So don't try to shift any blame on Electoral Commission. They are to do their work and present it to us. We pass or we decide not to pass. Let this be known to Ghanaians. If anything goes wrong, it's this house that will be held responsible, not electoral commission. That one, there is no pretense here, and I will not be part of it. That is why this exercise is being conducted. And we have to take it serious. Please. This one is life and death. We have moved away from that African practice of ballot and bullets. I don't know how many of you have read that article. Ballots and bullets. That is election in Africa. We have moved away from that in Ghana. And so Ghanaians are looking up to us. Don't let anybody go and misinform the public that this one is once again a political game between MPP and NDC. No. This is serious national business. A basic fundamental human right. So let's get it right. Don't blame Electoral Commission at all. Don't blame NIA. It's this house. Now you can go on. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, even the 16 million figure that the NIA is churning out. Mr. Speaker, this House needs to probe those figures. Because they have reported that in the Kintampo uh, municipality, they have captured over 57,000 people. But our, our checks from that office indicate that a little above 12,000 people have been captured. Mr. Speaker, our checks from the 
those officers indicate that, as we speak, some of the cars are in the offices. Because during the mass registration, when they deployed the resources to the rural communities, people registered, but they were not issued their cars instantly. They were asked to go and come for their cars. When they went back to the centers, they were told that they should go to the desert capital. Those who had the means to travel to those centers went and they got theirs. Many of these cars are locked up in the desert offices. People cannot even go there. They don't even know whether their cars are there to even go and collect them. And so there's a real difficulty. There's a real difficulty. And so, Mr. Speaker, we have a duty to safeguard the democracy that we have practiced for almost 30 years now. Just yesterday, Mr. Speaker, this House celebrated 30 years of parliamentary democracy. And I listened to your speech. I listened to the speech of my daughter Hilda, as well as that of my daughter Hilda. We are all proud to, have, to be associated with that enviable feat, having chalked, having been chalked for this nation. But Mr. Speaker, what we have to do is to put in place mechanisms to protect this enviable uh, feat we have chalked for ourselves. The only thing we have to do, and which is critical, is never to allow the electoral processes to be compromised or to be tempered in favor of one political party. That perception must be, er er must be erased completely from the minds of Ghanaians so that the sanctity of the process will be protected, will be restored, and Ghanaians will always expect that whatever happens at the end of the post reflects the opinions of Ghanaians. Mr. Speaker, on this note, I will urge this House to adopt this report that the House is ever not to allow and to reject any attempt by anybody in this country to use only the Ghana card to qualify Ghanaians to have their names on the letter room. Mr. Speaker, as you rightly said, this is not a matter of NDC MPP. This is a report signed by the majority leader, Honorable Oseche Mensah, recommending to this House, he is the leader of the majority caucus. He is the leader of government business in this House. And he is the Minister of Parliamentary Affairs. And he signs a report recommending to the House for adoption that the House will not allow and the House should be ready to reject any attempt by the Electoral Commission to introduce anything to this House to the effect that we should use only Ghana uh, card to, as a means of adaptation to have Ghanaians register. Mr. Speaker, with this few comments, Mr. Speaker, with these few comments, uh, I, I support the motion and recommend that the House approve and adopt this as the as the decision of this House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Honourable members, I don't think we have to continue to belabor this point. If you will not disagree with me, I will just ask the leaders to make their submissions. Then we go to the next, because there's another motion, also on the same thing. And then you have to have a meeting, a committee of the whole, to discuss this same issue today. All this today. If you want us to continue to call more members, then I'll reduce your time. Five minutes each is two, two. Two each. No, 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 no. The motion was moved by uh, Honorable uh, Majority Chief Whip and seconded by Honorable Haruna Idrisu and then went back to Honorable Obi Amwa and then came back to Honorable Eric Opoku. Yes, yeah, so now I wanted the leaders. Then after that, we can adopt the report, then move to the next motion.
That is my proposal. Yes. Right, Honorable Speaker, I agree with you that we need to manage the time. But, Mr. Speaker, as you originally said, this is a very, very serious issue. Uh, you gave an option. Uh, the second option was to reduce the time uh, to five minutes each. I would prefer, uh, if my colleagues will agree, that the rest of the speakers speak for five minutes uh, whilst we wait for the leadership. That will be uh, the middle position that will be helpful to all of us as a speaker. Speaker, unfortunately, I couldn't be with you at the preceding meeting. Indeed, this motion and the one following after that are underpinned by the same principle. And indeed, if I had been around, I would have canvassed the idea that we made the two motions. So that if we were to have five speakers from either side, we could, we could have done it. I don't see the distinction that we are, we are, we are, we are making. The speaker, so if, if we could perhaps bring the other motion on board, fair and fine. Otherwise, I will plead that we bring this first one to a conclusion by allowing the minority leader or his representative to close that chapter and then we we'll move to the other one. I think that is, that is better than going on this tangent. Like the leader has said, in structuring a debate, you give the legal, even you know the people are five, you give the legal aspect to one or two persons, then you give the political aspect to another person, then you give the socio-economic aspect to another person. That's how groups we structure debates. So if you know from the beginning, we could have gone by this, but we didn't know. So you gave us list, and we structured, as we are speaking now, those who are here to speak have their very area that we, so if you can reduce the time, which will be a middle lane, then we can give short, short time for the legal aspect, the socioeconomic aspect, and the other aspect. All right, all right members, five minutes each. Five minutes each, the leaders, 10 minutes each. So I move on to Honorable Mama Yarga, five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, please, please go on. Don't worry, I'll handle it. Please go on. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think the issues are straightforward. Fundamentally, the issue is about whether or not the Electoral Commission should pass a constitutional instrument that imposes an unreasonable, an unreasonable restraint on the rights of eligible voters to be registered to vote. The other issues have been addressed, so I'll focus on just two. One is, I participated in a briefing session involving the chairperson of the Electoral Commission. And at that briefing session, she indicated that the fundamental consideration driving the decision to abolish the use of the guarantor system is that it has been subjected to abuse. And so they want to move away from the guarantor system and rely entirely on the Ghana card. Mr. Speaker, at that meeting, I had cause to draw the attention of the Electoral Commission chairperson to the National Identification Register Act, because the National Identification Register Act prescribes how the register is compiled and what information is to be captured and how that information is to be proven. Mr. Speaker, I was surprised at that meeting to realize that the Electoral Commission itself 
did not realize that the National Identification Authority, which initially operated under the uh, Act 5750, and which did not provide for the use of the guarantor system, found out that it was almost impossible and difficult for them to do their job if they did not include a guarantor system. So they came to this parliament and sought an amendment to the National Identity Register Act in the National Identity Register Amendment Act of 2017, Act 950. And in Section 8 of it, they amended, in Section 3, they amended Section 8 of the principal enactment and included the use of guarantor system. So if you read the amendment to the National Identity Register Act, it says that Section 8 is being amended by B, by the substitution of subsection 2 of 2, where an applicant is unable to submit any of the documents specified under subsection A, the authority shall require A, a relative of the applicant to identify the applicant under oath. B, two persons determined by the board to identify the applicant under oath where the applicant has no known relatives. So I ask the chairperson, you are running away from your register on grounds of the abuse of the guarantor system, and you are running to embrace somebody's register. And yet that person whose register you are running to embrace is also including the guarantor system. So what is the basis of your principle? The sole document where you are going to, to use is also based on the same guarantor system. So, so, so what, 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 is the, what is the logic of what you are doing? And Mr. Speaker, I was surprised because that day it appeared that the members did not know that the National Identification Authority had come to amend their law to include a guarantor system. So, Mr. Speaker, if the fundamental issue here is the likelihood of the abuse of the guarantor system, then the Commission should know that the document that they are seeking to rely on is also based on the guarantor system. So, 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 so what is the basis? There's really no basis. Mr. Speaker, and it is unfair to those who are turning 18 between the last registration exercise and the next election for us to insist that they must have a Ghana card before they are registered. So, Speaker, there is a more fundamental constitutional argument. We know that the Electoral Commission has the constitutional power to pass CIs regulating elections. But they must be guided by their fundamental obligation under the Constitution, which is that every Ghanaian who is 18 years of age and above and of sound mind is entitled entitled to be registered. The Electoral Commission is not doing them a favor. And it is the duty of the Electoral Commission to establish that they are 18 years and above and they are citizens of Ghana. There are several source documents establishing their nationality. You cannot restrict it to just one source document. The Ghana card is beautiful. It makes work easy for everybody. But it is just one document that can, one doc tool that can be used to establish the nationality of a person. You cannot insist that it must be the sole instrument that should be used. So, Mr. Speaker, we are pleading with our colleagues, we are pleading with the Electoral Commission that they should not undermine the Constitution. Mr. Speaker, they themselves and subsequently will be debating the report on the, the National Education Authority. And you can see that if the National Education Authority also admits that they have challenges. So let's start it gradually. Let's just have it in the law that if you have a Ghana card, they should register you.
And in future, many years later, when we are all convinced, in fact, it might not even be necessary, because even if we are convinced, once we put it in our law, it becomes unconstitutional because we are impeding and restricting the rights of eligible uh, honorable voters. Member, I'll give you six minutes. I think it's more than enough. Mr. Speaker, I have actually made my point. That yes. they are moving away. Pardon? I agree with you. You have made your point. So yes, I'm saying that they are, they, they are moving away from the guarantor system and going to use a Ghana card, which is also based on the guarantor system. Right. That, that fundamentally is a logic that I'm waiting for them to explain to me. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Honorable members, we now listen to Honorable Amiyao Chiremen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to speak to the report of the Special Budget Committee. Mr. Speaker, there have been issues about the intended CI the Electoral Commission wanted to introduce in the House, which it laid before the subsidiary legislation committee for purposes of pre-laying discussions. Mr. Speaker, registration has been with us from the onset of the Fourth Republic. We even started it in 1988-89 before the district assembly elections in 89 and 90. Over the years, there have been progressive developments in our registration. We all recall that the first elections that we had in this country in 1992, we had opaque ballot boxes. We had ID cards that did not have photographs on them. Eventually, we graduated. We have transparent ballot boxes. We have ID cards that are even biometric, biometric. So, election after election, registration after registration, new concepts and ideas are introduced to uh, upgrade our electoral system. Mr. Speaker, there is no denying the fact that every day somebody turns 18. So when we do periodic registration and we go up, and we hold elections, people who turn 18 between the cutoff point of the registration and the election can also be said to have been denied the opportunity to register and vote. So if the Electoral Commission is introducing a new system whereby people who turn 18 or who did not have the opportunity to register in a previous registration exercise, register on a continuous basis, I think it's a good thing we must all work on. And it's one of the reforms the Electoral Commission seeks to introduce with the new CI it intends to introduce in this house. Mr. Speaker, if we are going to do continuous registration, the current legal framework tells us or gives opportunity to political parties to have agents at the registration centers for purposes of identifying people who are not eligible to register. If we are going to have continuous registration in the offices 
of the Electoral Commission, I doubt if 365 days or 366 days, all the political parties are going to have representatives as if they are permanent workers of the Electoral Commission. So we will need a source document that is more credible. So even in the absence of political party representation at the district's offices, registration can go on and we'll all continue to have faith in the system or the process. Mr. Speaker, we should not assume or pretend that registration has never occurred at district offices before. It has happened before, in the past, where the Electoral Commission limited registration exercises to the district offices. We all complied, and the people came from their towns and the, their various areas to register. But for the Electoral Commission even to say that registration will happen in the district offices, they haven't said that it is to the exclusion of moving even into the electoral areas for people to assess the registration. And of course, Mr. Speaker, if we are using the Ghana card, <laughs> there will be no need for uh, uh, the guarantor system and for even objections that accompany the registrations that we have done over the period. Mr. Speaker, I listened to Honorable Harry Nusu very well, and one of the issues that he raised is about the use of the Ghana card and the fact that the NIA reports to the Ministry of Interior. Mr. Speaker, if we use, if we use the passport, the passport office reports to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Wouldn't that also be an issue? If we use driver's license, Ministry of Transport. So whatever source document you want to use, you will link it to a particular ministry. Then we better don't do registration because you have issue with anything that you want to use. And so I think what we need to do is the assurance and the, from the EC that they will act right. They will act right. And then we can move on with it. Mr. Speaker, as uh, the, has been said, the figures, whether 16 point something million, 17 million, will have the opportunity to meet the two institutions, NIA and the Electoral Commission. They will be able to update us with current figures. And then if we are assured that the figures are good, and many Ghanaians, a very reasonable number of Ghanaians, have been enrolled onto the Ghana card. Then we can proceed with uh, the process or the new thinking by the Electoral Commission. Mr. Speaker, I want to conclude, and by so doing, I want to look at page 11 of the document which my brother, Honorable Eric Poco referred to. And I think his interpretation was a bit uh, swayed to support what he was saying. I, I was trying to give you the same time as that of uh, Honorable Mama Yarga, but you are adding some more seconds. Uh, I, I want to be consistent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
all that I want to say in conclusion is that if you look at page 11, paragraph 4, it says, it is clear that unless and until the challenges confronting the issuance of the Ghana card are dealt with using the Ghana card as the only medium of voter registration would negatively impact on the electoral rule and thereby deny some otherwise qualified persons from registering to vote. So if the challenges are addressed, what will be your issue? That's what I'm saying. If the challenges with the issuance of the Ghana card have been addressed or are addressed, then there will be no issue to challenge the laying of the CI or the, issue, the use of the Ghana card as a sole source document for registration. I'm most grateful, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Honorable members, we now listen to Honorable Mathieu Opoku Prempe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you've spent time to bring an understanding to an issue that has consequences for Ghana. But listening to colleagues, reading a report, I ask myself, what is this report seeking to do? Does this report help the debate out there? And does this report bring peace in the country? Mr. Speaker, I've come to the realization that anybody who picks up this report would interpret the report in a way he or she prefers. Mr. Speaker, why do I say that? The Honorable Member Eric Opoku, who spoke previously, quoting copious amounts of this document, really got the trunk. Because what he read and how he interpreted it, Mr. Speaker, was fundamentally wrong. There has never been an occasion since 1992 that any registration process of the EC has not disenfranchised Ghanaians in the true interpretation of the word. There has never been an occasion in this country since 1992 where all district registration centers or registration centers have been 100% coterminous with police centers. The speaker, or at every time, we in Ghana have tried to get the best possible way to bring peace during elections. And the conduct of our leaders post-elections have also engendered peace in this country. Mr. Speaker, what my brother quoted and I wanted to quote, again, the committee would like to emphasize that it has no objection, Mr. Speaker. Listen, the committee would like to emphasize that it has no objection against the EC using the NIA card to embark on the registration of eligible voters. Mr. Speaker, if you don't go on, if you don't go on to read further down, Mr. Speaker, you would have come again, Mr. Speaker, the simple advice you gave my brothers on the other side don't want to. What I'm saying is that if somebody reads this paragraph and doesn't go on further to read the second the paragraph of that, it, it depicts it depicts a committee that is siding with the Electoral Commission. In fact, Mr. Speaker, from the preceding paragraphs, the Electoral Commission had explained that its position it has taken has been agreed at IPAC. If you go to the paragraph after, it says, however, the committee would like to stress that it will not accept, Mr. Speaker, listen carefully, it will not accept and would reject any effort that is geared towards making the EC use 
the Ghana Cup as the only medium to qualify a person who is eligible to vote. Mr. Speaker, it is very interesting if you read it. They are talking about using Ghana Cup, the committee, in the voting, not registration. So when you sit as a committee and you come out with a report, it will reflect the debate we are going to have here. Nowhere has the committee said they disagree with the Electoral Commission in using Ghana Card for registration. What my brother quoted and what is written in the document are totally different. They are talking about eligibility to vote and what, what really he is seeking to do is about eligibility to register. Registration and voting are different issues. Never in this country has an ID card been a prerequisite for voting. On day of voting, every Ghanaian who attends finds his name in the register is eligible to vote. No card has ever barred anybody from voting in this country. Mr. Speaker, I would first like to caution that committee members when they are bringing reports to this House must do a better job than this. Why are we allowing ourselves to fight when the report that you have brought is totally different from the debate you are doing here? Because you don't read. That is our basic problem. The committee, yes, and I insist on it, the committee is talking about Ghana, the use of Ghana card as an eligibility to vote. The committee never reported the speaker to yourself about a confusion about using Ghana card as an eligibility to register. And I dare say, the laws in the country for registration... I, did I interrupt you? Mr. Mr. Speaker. You are, you are Mr. Speaker, if my brother... <laughs> Mr. Speaker... Yes, a minute. Yes. I will take the time, you know, I'm noting. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Mr. Speaker, the honorable colleague... Speak to the mic. The honorable colleague is saying something, is misinterpreting the report. Mr. Speaker, when you read down, the report says, with your indulgence, I read, it is clear that unless and until the challenges confronting the issuance of the Ghana card are dealt with, using the Ghana card as the only medium of voter registration will negatively impact on the electoral role and thereby deny some otherwise qualified persons from registering to vote. That is the So it's very clear. So please, take your time to read. Mr. Speaker. Yes, please, go on. Mr. Speaker, he has even made it worse. If, if you have not opened your mouth, you would have left people in doubt. But opening your mouth again has removed all that that you don't understand what you are reading. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I again emphasize and read it. Qualification and eligibility to register is never the same as eligibility to vote. In this country, we have never, never ever said if you are going to vote, you need a card. What he even read now, Mr. Speaker, makes it worse. All the committee said, all the committee said, what well, it might impact negatively. The committee never went on and said that because of that, the electoral commission should not bring the CR. That is why I'm saying that when you are writing reports, you should do a better and a more diligent job. This, this report, Mr. Speaker, this report, Mr. Speaker, is so flawed that I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know why. The majority leader, I don't know why the majority, I don't know why the majority leader even appointed the signature. Mr. Speaker, all I want to say is that we should proceed. Uh, well, I, I, I'll give you yes. one more minute. Don't worry. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you one more minute. Let me listen to the minority chief. Right, right honorable speaker. My good friend, the Majority Leader, you will have your time to, to take him on. Don't worry. My good friend, the minister responsible for energy, was flowing and everybody was following him. I take very strong exception 
to the fact that he's saying a report uttered and signed by the leader of this house is not fit for purpose. He used words like they should do a better job before they write reports. And I asked him to withdraw that, that portion of his statement that the minor, majority leader did a bad job with the report. He must withdraw that uh, portion of the statement. That is the leader of the house and your leader as well. Withdraw that portion of the uh, statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there we go again. The same words he has used, he doesn't understand. The same words he has just used, he doesn't understand. Mr. Speaker, people should restrain themselves from being happy with what they are saying, but thinking through what they are saying. Mr. Speaker, what I said, that this report and the this interpretation sites are giving to paragraphs they are reading means that the report is not clear. That is what I'm saying. If we are going to produce reports to bring to this house, that is not clear, and it's misrepresented by who is speaking, then we are doing ourselves a disfavor. That is why I'm saying that if the minority... Honor, leader, honor, minority honor, leader, honor, honor, member, I'm not too sure you yourself, you are listening to yourself. Your earlier submissions was to the effect that the report was so clear that it's rather people who are misreading and misinterpreting the report. Now you are saying that the report is not clear and you even doubted why the whole majority leader appended his signature to the report. And the words you use there, they say no, it's offensive to our leader. Withdraw that and apologize. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, in order not to cause more problems, I withdraw that and apologize. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I am saying that you, we will hear very soon in this house, we will hear very soon in this house, that two paragraphs quoted by my honorable friend is still is being misrepresented. That's why I'm saying that if the Electoral Commission is coming here on continuous voter registration, then this report, because they are not doing a new register, then this report cannot stop the Electoral Commission from bringing it. If they are not going to, if the Electoral Commission is not compiling a new register, then this report cannot stop them from bringing a CI. And that's why I was saying, if that is the intent of the committee, then they should have been clearer. Because this report doesn't say that. So um, all I'm saying is that the committee may have, might have met the Electoral Commission. They might have listened to the Electoral Commission. But the, um, this total report does not support the position and the conclusion that is being made. Because the issue was about eligibility to vote. Because when we caught him as about the registration, the committee never said that if the Electoral Commission was going to go ahead with that CR, then this committee should reject. It said there will be a negative impact. And I'm saying that since 1992, every registration, every voting has had some negative effect on somebody. But Ghana hasn't bent because of that, because of the leadership we have exercised. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just because you are my son, I gave you more minutes. You know. Um, I've, I've totally repented. I've, From today, I will tell your son. And it's going to be even better. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, we also have what we call prodigal son. So I understand. Um, can we now listen to... Honorable Dominic Akurutinga Ayini. Yeah. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute to the debate on this motion before this Honorable House. Mr. Speaker, if I were sitting in judgment over this matter, I would have simply said that I have nothing more useful to add to the erudite arguments of my learned brother, the Honorable Mahama Yarga of Boku Central fame. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Member for Boku Central nailed 
the issues. He put the nail in the coffin of this attempt to amend the law in order to bring this uh, CI. Mr. Speaker, arguments have been made in this House to the effect that this House cannot prevent the Electoral Commission from bringing an instrument to lay here. Mr. Speaker, that is the correct position of the law. And it was, it was first articulated by the Honorable Member for Mfutu, the Honorable Deputy Majority Leader. I agree in total with him. But, Mr. Speaker, what they conveniently leave out is the fact that we have a gatekeeping role as the Parliament of the Republic of Ghana. And that gatekeeping role, Mr. Speaker, is in Article 11, 7 of the Constitution of the Republic. The Honorable Obi Amoa, when he made his arguments, he made his submissions, was very clear that whenever an instrument is laid, we in this House cannot change the instrument. We can change the substantive content of the instrument. However, we have an opportunity to annul it in accordance with Article 11, 7 of the Constitution. But Mr. Speaker, we need to test majority of this House to annul it. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, we have adopted the convention of having the pre-laying, which, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to learn today that you were part of the history-making for that pre-laying uh, you know, um, convention. But, Mr. Speaker, our gatekeeping role is further stated in the standing orders of this House. And, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I would want to quote Standing Order 166 of the Standing Orders. Mr. Speaker, Standing Order 1663 says that after an order, rule, or regulation is laid before the House, the Committee, that is the Committee on Subsidiary Legislation, in particular, shall consider a number of things. I want to uh, emphasize two of them. One is that they must consider whether or not the instrument accords with the general objects of the Constitution or an act passed by Parliament. And then another is, I want to quote that one verbatim. It says, whether it appears to make some unusual or unexpected use of the powers conferred by the Constitution or the act pursuant to which it is made. Mr. Speaker, we are not yet debating the substantive content of the instrument. I am sure we will have an opportunity to do that if it is ever laid before this Honorable House. Then, Mr. Speaker, I have had the opportunity at the pre-laying session to examine its substantive content. And I take the view, preliminarily, that it does not accord with the objects of the Constitution. That's the first thing. Secondly, I think that the Electoral Commission in this matter is seeking to exercise its power in an unusual and unexpected way. Mr. Speaker, what is an unusual exercise of power? Constitutional, I mean, power. Mr. Speaker, will remember uh, our first year jurisprudence and uh, Professor Gordon Woodman's distinction between the lawyer's law and the sociologist's law. The lawyer's law is a black letter law as stated in the Constitution. The sociologist's law is the law in practice. What we on this side of the House is pointing out to the people of this country and to our colleagues in the majority is that as far as the sociologist's law is concerned, this is going to be a very bad precedent. Mr. Speaker, when there is a, a substantial deviation between the lawyer's law and the sociologist's law, then there is an unusual exercise of constitutional power. So, for instance, in the case of uh, Pruis, my honorable colleague, the honorable member for Pruis, just gave me the evidence. With respect to registration of the NIA in his constituency, Mr. Speaker, this is very important. He said the total registered, as he has found out, is 17,992. Total cards issued, 
13,433. Total year to issue, 2,148. And then year to print is 2,410. So, Mr. Speaker, you will see that except those who have been issued with a card and are holding their card in their hand, if elections were held today, about 4,000 and over people in Blue East will not have the right to vote. Mr. Speaker, that, that in and of itself, no, on, yes, on the register is 44,000. The point is that the deviance between those who are, have been accorded a right to vote because they are holding the card and those who have not been given the right to vote because they have been denied the card is very, very significant statistically. So, Mr. Speaker, that is an unusual or unexpected exercise of constitutional power. Mr. Speaker, when the Electoral Commission came before the Subsidiary Legislation Committee, I asked them one fundamental question. I said, what mischief are you supposed, are you going to cure with this amendment? What mischief? And they said, basically the same thing that the Honorable Maham Ayerga said that the guarantee system is subject to abuse. And so I asked them in my capacity as chairman that they should bring the evidence of the abuse to convince the committee that the system is actually being abused. Mr. Speaker, the first evidence that they brought showed only that in the entire re period of registration, only four persons, Mr. Speaker, four persons were caught abusing the system. Four. Out of 17,029,908, I mean, persons registered by the Electoral Commission during that registration period, only four were caught, prosecuted, and convicted, Mr. Speaker. So, four out of 17 million is the reason why we are coming to change the law. So, I asked for better and better particulars, Mr. Speaker. And then, what did they do? Mr. Speaker, they went and brought evidence again to back what they what they, they had given me they are giving they, they are giving the committee and the evidence they brought was a statistical table mr speaker a statistical table i don't want to impugn the integrity of the commission and its staff but the statistical table said that out of the entire 17 million over 17 million registered voters it was only 15,000. 474 representing, they didn't do this, I mean, the mass. I did the mass myself with the help of uh, the Honorable Kodu, representing 0.09% of the total number of registered persons. 0.09%. Mr. Speaker, this is highly insignificant. Why are we here debating this issue? And we are going to expend taxpayers' resources in, in doing a registration that is totally unnecessary. Mr. Speaker, in Rans for France and Attorney General, my, 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 uh, the former chairman of subsidiary legislation, the Honorable Obi Amwa, Mr. Speaker, he was with me in that case when I wrote an amicus brief that won the case. And in that case, the Supreme Court was very clear that the EC does not need a, 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 a constitutional instrument in order to exercise its power. In this case, we are not even confronted with we are not even confronted with a situation where they have no constitutional instrument. We have since 2016, since 2016, we have the uh, CI 91 and we have CI 126, Mr. Speaker, gazetted, and under these instruments continuous registration can take place. So why is it, Mr. Speaker, that we are calling upon this House to pass the, I mean, the, the new instrument in order to enable them undertake continuous registration? Mr. Speaker, I would want to conclude by saying that if the, mat, if the thing is not broke, you don't fix it. If the, mat, the thing is not broke, don't fix it. The Electoral Commission has not convinced this House that the current law is a broken system. We don't need to fix it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Honorable Afenio Markin is the next. Mr. Speaker, um, thank you for the opportunity to add my voice to the debate on the floor. Mr. Speaker, I must emphasize that on the 27th of February, 2015, the Supreme Court delivered a decision in a matter of Benjamin E. Mensah. Benjamin E. Mensah versus an Electoral Commission with Attorney General as a second defendant. The Speaker, this was suit number J1-11-2015. The Supreme Court stated correctly the position of the law that the Electoral Commission, for the purpose of exercising the mandate under the Constitution, is required to proceed with a constitutional instrument. It was a reason why the then District Assembly elections had to be postponed for a new CI to be laid. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, in arriving at that conclusion, the Supreme Court had to resort to the hands out of this House. And that is why the debate of today is so dear to me, that should there be any litigation, the court would want to rely on the submissions by us. And at the time, Mr. Speaker, we were in opposition, and we argued. I'm happy the lawyers in the minority are now changing their position. I don't know whether you are a lawyer. Your position will change depending on which side of government you are. But, Mr. Speaker, the Deputy Attorney General then, <laughs> Honorable Dr. Dominic Ayeni, argued that there was no such need for a new CI in the, on this floor. That's what he said. And went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, the Electoral Commission needed a CI for the purpose of public elections. So, Mr. Speaker, the point here is that the requirement to have a CI is constitutional. So nobody should mislead anybody. Nobody should mislead anybody into any misunderstanding of the correct position of the law. Mr. Speaker, again, Honorable Mahama Yerga, who misunderstood and misappreciated the law, had said that under the Electoral Commission's own enactment, there is a guarantor system. And same is found in the NIA law. What he failed to tell us is that under the EC system, there is no such requirement to do any deposition under oath. Mr. Speaker, that is the difference. And if you come to Act 750, under Act 750, Mr. Speaker, 750, Section 82, Section 82 provides that, Mr. Speaker, there is a requirement for the guarantor to do so under oath. And, Mr. Speaker, NI further came to do an amendment under Act 950, Mr. Speaker, the amended act, even expanded the system of guarantor where somebody, apart from your parents, your MP, or other persons, provided they can do so under oath. Mr. Speaker, what did they seek to achieve? All they wanted to do was to ensure that whoever did so, did so truthfully, unlike what we had under the EC system previously, where anybody at all could guarantee. And providing the guarantee, the person could choose to do so anyhow. Mr. Speaker, so the distinction is clear in the law. So nobody should mislead any of us. Mr. Speaker. Um, please. 
The Honourable Amaya Rai. Mr. Speaker, is free to. No problem. Yes. I, will, yes. I will take my seat. Yes, yes, sir. Mr. Speaker, the point that I sought to make is that the EC said there are main reason for wanting to use only Ghana card. Their main reason was that the guarantor system is subject to abuse. And I drew the attention to the fact that the NIA itself, which did not have a guarantor system, has reverted to the use of a guarantor system, even if it is with some qualifications. Even if it is with some qualifications. So why would they be running away from one guarantor system to another form of guarantor system? So, Speaker, so address the question of a guarantor system, no matter how structured. Unless you deny that the NIA system doesn't have any form of a guarantor system, then my response to them stands valid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yes, please. He has made his case worse. In your, your, in, in both submissions, you have you have created an impression, okay, that the guarantor system in the health in the, in the electoral commission law and that of the uh, national identification authority law, those guarantor systems are the same. They are not, Mr. Speaker. They are not. It's the, 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 Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I just don't get it. Mr. Speaker, I don't get it. We listen to them in silence. Are you Democrats? We listen to you in silence. This is a legal argument. Listen. What is this? Because you are shouting. You don't respect the Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Electoral Commission said its guarantor system is subject to abuse because a person was not required to do so under oath. If you look at the Parent Act, and I want members to turn to the law, because I have read it, go to the Parent Act, Section 82 is there. The National Identification Authority again came back for the amendment. That amendment enhanced that earlier provision. And that amendment expanded it so that it is not only limited to your parents, so that Ghanaians will not be disenfranchised. So it shouldn't be said, it shouldn't be said by Honorable Ayarga that the EC has said it could not fight for its own guarantor system. So why should it be that the NIA would also rely on the same guarantor system and EC would accept it. There's a difference. One, you do so freely. The second, you do so under oath. You are a lawyer. You know what is the difference between making a free statement and making a statement under oath. You know the difference. Mr. Speaker, my second point. The, in, in the argument of Honorable Harry Nedrisu, he referred to Article 42 of the Constitution. And Mr. Speaker again referred to Article 45 of the Constitution. And Mr. Speaker, he created the impression that the Electoral Commission had failed in its mandate because in 2021-2022, Ghanaians attained the age of 18 and the Electoral Commission failed to register them. That is not the correct constitutional provision he quoted. Mr. Speaker, if you read Article 45A, quote, the Electoral Commission shall have the following functions to compile the register of voters and revise it as such period as may be determined by law. Mr. Speaker, there is no such requirement, be it constitutional or through any enactment, that every year there must be a registration process. What the law says is that the Electoral Commission must ensure that it's registered within periods so that, Mr. Speaker, 
before there is any public election, issue is issue take steps to register qualified Ghanaians to vote. And this is done by an enactment. And that is a journey they have embarked on. Mr. Speaker, again, there is a provision that talks about a member qualifying to be elected as a member of parliament, a Ghanaian qualifying to be elected as a, as a member of parliament. The law does not say that you must be a registered voter before. It does not say so. So, Honorable Honorable Edusu again misled the Ghanaian public. The law talks about being qualified. You must qualify to be registered. And I think that matter was again dealt with in the Zanato case at the Supreme Court when she was challenged at the time that she was not a registered voter or so at the Collet Flotte. And the matter was at the Supreme Court for determination. The court was clear. You must be qualified, not necessarily a registered voter. You must qualify. That is the law. But Honorable Harry Nedrusu said that you must be a registered voter. That is what he said. Please, you didn't pay attention. Mr. Speaker, so whatever we are seeking to do is to enable the Electoral Commission embark on a mandate required of them by law. Mr. Speaker, I, however, agree with the position taken by Honorable Harry Nedrusu that limiting registration at EC's district office will be very problematic. That I agree. This is not a new argument. This is an argument that, Mr. Speaker, the MPP raised in 2016 when we were in opposition. So, Mr. Speaker, just as we are pre-laying requirements, the pre-laying which allows discussions and amendments before the final laying of it, I believe that such discussions will lead to this provision being considered. That one should not be a problem. Mr. Speaker, in any event, whose business is it to make something difficult or less difficult. Mr. Speaker, in the year 2000, we had voter ID cards with on print, without pictures. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, at the time, I had, I was a student at UCC, where J.H. Mensah and Co. were saying, no vote, no photo ID, no vote. Eventually, Mr. Speaker, yes. No, it wasn't changed in 2000. In 2000, we voted with both the photo ID and a thumbprint ID. But when you are bound to win, you win. If you win, you win. <laughs> if you win, you win. Mr. Speaker, if you win, you win. So it is not this issue about somebody is trying to disenfranchise it. Mr. Speaker, the minority is creating an impression that it has such powers to deny a constitutional body its right to exercise its mandate. Who said, who said that you have that right to prevent EC from laying its here? Then it means you don't want the, the commission to do its work. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Agoja, Mr. Speaker, I want to draw attention to a matter. Honorable Agoja is a chief whip. He has sat on Honorable Collins down the seat and shouting across Mr. Speaker, I don't think that is fair. Mr. Speaker, I don't think that is fair. So, Mr. Speaker, nobody, nobody is denying, nobody is denying any Ghanaian an opportunity to participate in the Judicial Assembly elections later, later in the year and in the 2024 elections. What we are doing is to ensure that qualified Ghanaians register so that our register will be a register of Ghanaians. All input we have, Mr. Speaker, we must forcefully may bring them on board so that the right things are done. Mr. Speaker, we should not create any impression. We should not create any impression that something untoward is being done. If you read, if you read the report of the committee, the co committee made very serious observations. And the EC explained that they are not compiling a new register. So, Mr. Speaker, the provision, there is an aspect 
That has been misconstrued at page 11. Page 11, paragraph 2. I mean the second paragraph of page 11, which talks about Ghana card as the only medium to qualify a person who is eligible to vote in 2024 election. That the committee is saying that it is not going to allow easy to proceed on that path. What he's trying to say, Mr. Speaker, is that for those of us who have already registered, we had other sort of document that we use in registration. That cannot become a choice. However, going forward, it is expected that, Mr. Speaker, the requirements as expected will be respected. Mr. Speaker, it's as simple as that. I do not see how Honorable Atul Fawson would have to be worried or any other member of parliament would have to be worried that somebody is seeking to disenfranchise somebody. Where? Which constituency? Which region? And how does that prevent you from winning your election? Mr. Speaker, in the last elections, our colleagues made similar, I won't call it noise, came out with all manner of views. Even on the registration, they said there was no such requirement to have registration. But when we eventually registered and we participated in the voting, you have your 137, which you are happy about, and then we won. You went to the Supreme Court, you could not produce your, 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 your pink sheets. How, how did the new registration that enabled Ghanaians to register? How did it affect you? So what became of all the Kula Balu, Mr. Speaker? What became of all the atmosphere that you poisoned, Mr. Speaker? If, as Democrats, if, as parliamentarians, we do not come together, and as Mr. Speaker, you said, this is a matter of our democracy. It's not NDC, it's not MPP. What we do not know, we don't have to say them. If the thing is not proper, you don't create a certain impression to undermine the democracy. Mr. Speaker, the minority leader is on the street. Uh, minority leader, I was trying to end his submission. What is it? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thought you gave us 10 minutes for leaders, but you spoke more than 10 minutes. I just wanted to... Sorry? Mr. Speaker, you gave us 10 minutes. 10 minutes. And he's been speaking on his feet for far more than that. So I thought I should draw your attention to the fact that you gave us time to speak with him. Actually, you realize that even though I stated five minutes per person, I went beyond that. Because the issues being raised are so germane and important that I found it difficult to stop members. So I gave, for example, Honorable Mama Yaga seven. I gave his counterpart here seven, 30 seconds. I gave others eight. You know, because they were making very good points. So when it comes to your turn and you are in full flight, I can't stop you at 10. It will be difficult because the second motion, we're actually truncating it to about 2-2, two, two, not 5-5 five, five again. And then we can then do the um, uh, committee of the whole. The electoral commission, the NIA, they've been here the whole day. We haven't even given them water, we haven't given them nothing, just like you seated here. So, we are all concerned. Please, wind up, wind up, so that we can move on. Mr. Speaker, thank you for ruling him out of order. Honorable Minority Leader, next time when you want to rise up, you should rise on a proper point of order, not to obstruct and disrupt my thoughts of argument. Mr. Speaker, I shall conclude by submitting that this CI is necessary for the purpose of the limited registration. We must put, make our inputs 
we must make our input, which input will strengthen what has already been submitted. Mr. Speaker, we should aim at ensuring that all those who are qualified to vote register, participate in the limited registration exercise, and to educate our people. We should not, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we should not split heads over this. And I believe that if the right information is ferried across to the populace, our democracy will be guaranteed. But for now, the attempt by some members of parliament to poison the atmosphere, Mr. Speaker, should not in any way be entertained or encouraged. Mr. Speaker, I do not understand that the same argument that the NDC made in support of the Electoral Commission, today, they are making the same argument against them. Mr. Speaker, it is very rich. We have been consistent. The MPP majority in Parliament. Honorable Deputy Majority Leader, you have now moved away from the Minority Caucus to the NDC party. Now, some members are compelled to rise up on point of order. I'll be compelled to invite them. And you know, the time is of essence in this matter. Please. Yes, uh, what is it? Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker, for the opportunity. I am rising on point of order 92, order 92. 1B, Order 92, 1B. In the submission of the senior leader, he referred to what Honorable Haruna said in the morning, that the Electoral Commission failed Ghanaians to have not carried out a limited registration in 2021, 2022, and they now want to have it done. And he, the leader, quoted Article 45, and I want to take him to, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, to Article 45E. And one of the it's one of the functions of the Electoral Commission. It says the function to under the Electoral Commission is to undertake programs for the expansion of the registration of voters. This is an this is one of the functions of them. So if Honorable Aruna referred to the fact that they failed us. He, um, he based his, I'm sure he based his, his, he, he made reference to this function of the Electoral Commission. I thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, first of all, first of all, I thank, I, 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 I thank my colleagues, I thank my honorable colleague for the courage in rising on her feet to challenge me. Mr. Speaker, but she, she got the, she got the rule wrong. She says she's coming under 92B, 92B, and she got it wrong. If you want to learn the rules, learn them properly. You said 92B, the provision is not what it says. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, they don't, they, they all said yeah, yeah to her. But you see, she has misled them, and I need to correct her so that they get corrected. She corrected them, and they said he, she, she was wrong, misled them, and they said yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, 92B, 92B that you quoted was wrongly quoted. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I will read it aloud for her to learn, learn the rules better. Mr. Speaker, 92B, to elucidate some matter, 92B has to do with elucidation, not a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I shall proceed. The argument, Mr. Speaker, he said, she said, Honorable Harry Nejusu was right in talking about the need for a yearly registration. Mr. Speaker, I again state that Honorable Harry Nejusu got the law wrong. Periodic registration before public election does not necessarily mean a yearly registration. That I, I, See the way Atu is quiet. You should learn from your leader. 
Actually, now you're no more a backbencher. You are now in the, at the front bench where we use legal arguments and other arguments to support our point. You don't shout. Mr. Speaker, and other arguments, and other. I say so. Mr. Speaker, so I want to state that your time, your time is up. Your time is up. Okay. Honorable member, it's now the turn of Honorable Ahmed Ibrahim for and on behalf of the leadership of the minority. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for giving me this opportunity. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I have sat here and listened to the various contributions on the motion. Thankfully, Mr. Speaker, my A-level government teacher is in this chamber. And Mr. Speaker, my political science course mate, Honorable Dr. Bosman Asari, is in this chamber. Honorable Santiahi is in this chamber. Mr. Speaker, my A-level government teacher is in this chamber. And he taught me one thing I have never forgotten. And that is the development of franchise in the history of Ghana. Mr. Speaker, in, oh, Mr. Speaker, he taught me for free, so I'm not ashamed to mention his name. And that's why I'm a good product and I'll be able to qualify to come here. The Honorable Former Majority Chief Whip, Honorable Ambeyao, Pesia Ambeyao Chirame, taught me A-level government in Sunyani Secondary School. Honorable Dr. Bosma Asare and Honorable Ahe, Eman Gusel, with Honorable Dr. Pesta White, were all taught political science by Professor Michael Gray, University of Ghana. And I wish we implement what we were taught. Mr. Speaker, how did we develop franchise and got to this level? Mr. Speaker, before we got to Universal Adults of Bridge, franchise or voting was restricted to only the rich men. You needed to own a house before you could qualify to vote. Mr. Speaker, some people fought. Some people fought. In some countries, women were not even allowed to vote. Some people fought and shed their blood before we could attain universal adult suffrage. So, Mr. Speaker, it is very wrong for us to now be restricting and tightening the right to vote. And, Mr. Speaker, I say it with my heart bleeding within. Because if we cannot open and make the electoral process participatory in nature, where more Ghanaians, eligible qualified voters in Ghana can have the right to vote, we must not close the door onto them. Why am I saying this? Mr. Speaker, I've listened to the debate from the other side. And Honorable Obi Amwa spoke about the expenses involved and the nature and the strenuous effort in carrying continuous, current, limited voter registration. So the mischief they want to cure is to embark upon continuous registration. Mr. Speaker, if that was the reason for introducing this new CI, CI 91, Section 9, Regulation 9, which was passed in 2016, made provision for continuous voter registration. And Mr. Speaker, with your permission, CI 91, Section 91, period of registration. Regulation 91, period of reg registration. The Commission shall register voters on continuous basis. This is what passed in this house in 2016. So, Mr. Speaker, the Commission shall register voters on continuous basis. 
So if continuous registration is what Dr. Tribua wants to embark upon, you have the law. Go ahead. You don't need a new CI before you can embark upon continuous voter registration. And Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Obi Amwa is aware of this. He was the chairman of subsidiary legislation and he passed this. Mr. Speaker, I have the report. The report of the Committee on Subsidiary Legislation on the Public Election Registration of Voter Regulation 2016, CR91. Mr. Speaker, it is signed by Chairman of Committee of Subsidiary Legislation, Honorable Obi Amwa. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I quote from Honorable Obi Amwa's report. Mr. Speaker, page four. Page four. Oh, you did a good job. Don't run away from your old job. You did a good job. Mr. Speaker, on page four, I have to this to say. The committee took the committee took note that CR91 makes provision for modalities for continuous registration in consultation with registered political parties. This is what he said. And this is the CI91. So if continuous registration is what the Electoral Commission wants to embark upon, the Electoral Commission was well equipped with the law from 2016. You don't need a new please. CI before you could do let, let, continuous let, let, registration. Let, please, may we listen to him. Since you mentioned his name and read a report which he signed, you want to deny on his feet. Yes, please. Don't you deny it's not your report? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, indeed, I don't know why the Deputy Whip is seeking to drag my name in this. We passed, we passed the CI in this house. I was then the chairman. 2020, we passed another CI in this house. Dominic Aini was the chairman. Now the EC seeks to pass another CI. How does he connect this to and bring my name in this matter? I don't understand him. He's just playing to the gallery. I don't understand what he's saying. I don't understand what he's saying and he's seeking to impugn my integrity. Where is the latest CI? And who passed? Who was the chair? And what is the latest CI saying? Ah. Honorable Obi Amwa, I just didn't understand your last part. What did you say? Ah. You are addressing me. Sorry, Mr. Speaker, I, I thought I'd put on the phone. I'd put off the speaker. So the eye shouldn't be part of the statement I made in the hands that is yes. the Honorable Ahmed Ibrahim, Deputy Minority, you may continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, the first point raised by the other side, which mischief they seek to cure by introducing a new CI, has fallen flat. It has no leg to stand on. Since continuous registration is already catered for in the existing CI. Mr. Speaker, I proceed, and it is this CI, CI 91, which was used to register the 2016 general presidential and parliamentary election. Deputy Majority Leader, the Majority Leader will be making the submissions. If you have a point, pass it on to him. What is it on? Mr. Speaker, with the greatest respect. Yes. Mr. Speaker, with the greatest respect. Yes. I rise on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, point of order. It is so. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my respected colleague on his feet is referring to a 2016 CR to suggest that there is no such requirement.
for a new seer. Mr. Speaker, I am only on my feet to draw his attention to a Supreme Court ruling on, I, on, on I, that provision. I, 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 Mr. Speaker, I, the Supreme Court has interpreted. I beg you. And if I you beg permit you. me, I read. I didn't get that from his submission at all. Mr. Speaker, that's what he said. Mr. No. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, let me help. Mr. Speaker. No. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, he said that Honorable Obi Amwa signed the CI, the report. And in that CI, there is a provision for continuous registration. Therefore, why the need for a new CI since we already have a CI in existence? Mr. Speaker, it is upon that no. basis that I have risen no, that, to draw that, his attention that, that, that please, please. There's, a consu there's a Supreme Court ruling. Please, the issue he raised there was the fact that an impression was created that that was an introduction of reforms in this new CI that is being proposed. He was simply drawing our attention to the fact that that had existed in an earlier CI. That was the issue he raised. It's not a new reform that is being introduced by this current draft CI. That was the issue he raised. Please, you are under pressure, so sometimes you are compelled to whisper to one or two people and you lose trend. I'm following the debate and I'm guiding you on. Please, you may continue. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, so this year, 91 was used to conduct the, to register in 2016 and to conduct elections, which the new patriotic party won with over 1 million difference. In 2020, Mr. Speaker, a portion of the CI-91 was amended because of the ruling of the Supreme Court. And Mr. Speaker, that gave birth to CI-126. Mr. Speaker, in CI-126, qualification criteria for identification for registration was reduced. Proof of citizenship was reduced to a passport, a national identification card, and a voter registration identification guarantee system. After the ruling of the Supreme Court, Parliament amended Regulation 1 of the CI-91, and that gave birth to CI-126. Mr. Speaker, what a man saying? In 2016, CI-91. In 2020, CI-126. 2024, another CI is coming. Mr. Speaker, what are we seeking to do? Put that one aside. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Electoral Commission, in a bid to embark upon a voter registration exercise, and when we met him, if you read the report, Mr. Speaker, he said the National Identification Authority people have promised and given assurance that by 2024, all eligible registrants in Ghana will be issued with the Ghana card. Mr. Speaker, I want to remind the chairperson of the Electoral Commission and her deputies that this year, 2023, we have a district level election to embark upon. Are you saying that you want to do away with limited registration and go and embark? Honorable, honorable. Uh, deputy Minority Whip, you cannot be addressing the Electoral Commission here. She is not a member of this House for you to address it, for her to have the opportunity to reply. So please, if you look at the standing orders, this is not permitted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I was addressing you. Mr. Speaker, I was just... No, you are not addressing me. Mr. Speaker, may I remind this House and the country at large that this year, not 2024, 
It would be wrong for anybody to quote 2024 and say we have two years ahead. And therefore, we can register and give every Ghanaian a Ghana card before we can register and go to 2024. We have district-level elections to carry upon in this year, 2023. Mr. Speaker, if you don't embark upon limited registration, how are you going to give eight Ghanaians of 18 years and above, or Ghanaians who were outside the country before the last registration, how are you going to give them the opportunity to be able to register? So, Mr. Speaker, limited registration is inevitable. And the Electoral Commission must embark upon limited registration to enable eligible voters to be able to register and vote in the district-level elections. Mr. Speaker, the district-level election is supposed to be in September 2023. If care is not taken, it will be shifted to November. Honorable, honorable member, don't believe at this point. The Electoral Commission simply said, I am not compiling a new voter register. That is all. Revising the existing register. They haven't denied. Because if you are to update it, you are adding to what is already there. You are revising. And that is allowed by the Constitution and the law. There's nothing wrong with that. Let's go through the main issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, back on the report. In page 9, that is NIA reliance on the National Identification Authority. And Mr. Speaker, I want to quote paragraph 2, page 9 of the report. Some committee members observed the, com the Commission's overly reliance on the NIA and therefore draw the attention of the laws that established the Commission and further set out its mandate. We do not immediately link NIA into the Ghana democratic process. And therefore, the Commission to take responsibility and reduce the attempt to make NIA operations part of its process. The Speaker, I was part of the Special Budget Committee that met the Electoral Commission. Mr. Speaker, when we quoted the briefing of the National Identification Authority people to them, they themselves were surprised. And Mr. Speaker, this is a ministerial briefing. When the Honorable Amrozeri led the NIA people to come and brief this house, what do we have on this ministerial briefing? Mr. Speaker, page 7 of 9, the last paragraph, Second, listen, inadequate budgetary allocation and releases by the Minister of Finance. This was a major challenge that the NIA put before us. And Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I read. A major challenge facing NIA is inadequate budgetary allocation of funds and untimely releases of funds by the Minister of Finance to implement NIA's programs and activities. NIA submitted a proposed budget of $326 million 740,669 cities, 34 pesos, for the year 2022. Mr. Speaker, in January 2022, a budget ceiling of 236 million was released to NIA by the Minister of Finance. Further, the January 2022 budget ceiling of 236 has been further revised. Mr. Speaker, further revised. Further revised by the Minister of Finance under the Emergency Rationalization Messages Directive from the Office of the President to 180 million. Mr. Speaker, the NIA wanted a budget of 326 million. The Minister of Finance gave them a ceiling of 236 million. And in the, within that same year, told them that you cannot even get the 236, I'm going to give you 180. Mr. Speaker, listen to what the NIA itself has to say. The net effect of the release and its subsequent downward revision is that NIA will not have enough funds to execute its major activities, including registration of Ghanaians in diaspora and registration of children below the age of 15 years, among others. The inability of the NIA to commence these activities 
will gravely affect the enforcement of the use of the Ghana card, use of the Ghana card for the promotion of economic, social, and political activities in Ghana. Speaker, this is a ministerial briefing of the NIA. They themselves are telling us that their budget has been cut from 326 to 236 to 180. And because of that, the inability to get this amount will have great effect on using the Ghana card for political, social, and economic activities. So, why does the NI, the Electoral Commission, want to rely on this? When the NIA themselves, the Ghana card people themselves, are saying that you cannot use their Ghana card for registration purposes or for, politi for political purposes because of inadequate of funds, they cannot give card to every Ghanaian. Mr. Speaker, you put that one aside. In the same briefing, on that day, the frequent shortage of blank cars and printing of cars, that's another reason. Mr. Speaker, the fourth reason was delayed payment of government support agreement. The government himself is not able to pay his part of the public-private partnership agreement that the NIA has entered with their technical partners. These are the challenges they gave to us. The Speaker, I will not permit me to quote all the challenges. NIA said another problem they face is poor network coverage. And they mentioned, the Speaker, your region, the Upper West region, most of the areas NIA says that they cannot procure Ghana card for them because there's no network coverage. In the Western North region, where the cocoa farmers are, there's poor network in that region. Most part of Ghana, there's poor network region. So they are calling on the Minister of Communication to extend connectivity. connectivity to those communities and those regions before they can give them card. Mr. Speaker, why will Parliament go ahead to pass a law in anticipation that in future the Minister of Communication will send Electric, this is net, mobile network to those areas for internet to access East NIA before they can give them card. And what would Ghanaians say of us? If you know you are going to vote this year, you cannot extend electricity to those areas, you cannot extend network connectivity to those areas, you cannot enable all those people there to be able to register onto the Ghana card, and you go ahead to pass this law in its current form at this time. Mr. Speaker, reading the report, the Electoral Commission says they met with IPAC and built a consensus before drafting this CI. The question is, was the, was the National Democratic Party, National Democratic Congress, the NDC for short, present at that meeting where the IPAC took that decision that this CI should be in this form? Mr. Speaker, that aside, the NDC controls 137 MPs in this chamber. So it will be a major problem to proceed to have a meeting with political parties without the NDC and come out with a CI and call upon us to accept it. Mr. Speaker, put that one aside. In the 2020 elections, the MPP had 6.7 million, the NDC had 6.2 million. So going ahead to convert political parties and build consensus with that, the party that gave about 6.2 million people voted for, without inviting that party to that meeting, then you say there's consensus. What kind of consensus is that? In that regard, Mr. Speaker, I want to call upon you. Since the National Democratic Congress was not party to the so-called IPAC meeting. That gave that to this CI, Mr. Speaker. You cannot say that there was consensus. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, knowing the challenges that we have and where we have come to, Mr. Speaker, the former chairperson, former chairman of the Electoral Commission, Dr. Kwejo Afarijan, is quoted to have said that 
making the Ghana card the sole criteria for identifying who a Ghanaian is and using it to embark upon voter registration will be a recipe for disaster. Mr. Speaker, I don't think any major thing involving the fundamental human right of the Ghanaian, that law should be passed in this form. Mr. Speaker, I was here. The right to information, which comes under Article 21 of the 1922 Constitution, started in this House for about 10 years. In 2002, it was passed in 2017 or 2018. We went about, about nationwide consultation. We consulted civil society organizations. We went to all the regional capitals. We explained it to them. As we are here now, most Ghanaians, most civil society organizations, people in the academia, people who queue and vote for us, are not aware that parliament or electoral commission is carrying on an exercise in this form, where people are going to be disenfranchised because they don't have Ghana card. Last speaker, in preparing to conclude, the reason why I quoted the evolution of franchise and how we move from property owing voting right to a free universal voting right is that the speaker in getting the Ghana card, rich men in Ghana are called to pay 250 Ghana cities and they are given instant Ghana card. So if we accept this CI in its current form, since the rich men can pay the 250 Ghana cities or 2.5 million in the old the old currency and get their Ghana card. The rich men will pay and have their Ghana card and go and register and vote. The poor man who do not have the 250 cities, the speaker, and cannot even travel from their area to register capital, will be disenfranchised from taking part in the district level election in 2023 and in the 2024 general election. The speaker, since when? Even the white man before independence gave Ghanaians the right to vote. Uh, Why is the black man trying to use money? You pay 250 uh, before you get Ghana card. Honorable Deputy Whip, let me listen to the Honorable Deputy Minister for Local Government, Decentralization and Rural Development. Oh, you didn't speaker. catch my eye. Mr. Speaker, thank you so much. This is a house of records. The impression the Deputy Whip is creating is that we are debating CI here. There's no CI before us. For us to reject any CI, reject any CI, we are not debating any CI. We are debating the report of the Special Budget Committee. And it has nothing to do with any intended CI by, by the EC. So I don't know why he's referring to rejecting the CI. It's going to our hazard. And it's wrong. Yes, Honorable Deputy Minority Whip, please take that along. And also be cautious about the immunities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. But what, what I want to say and to remind this House is that since the NIA has a premium service for the rich men who can pay the 250 Ghana cities to get the Ghana card instantly, but does not have processes to help the poor man, the poor cocoa farmer in the western north, the poor cocoa farmer in the Jassican I, I, I just drew your attention to be cautious about the immunities. That is why I mentioned that thing. I'm sure many of you did not get the, the issue. Here, you are immune. Free speech. You can say anything. You cannot be taken outside, you cannot be prosecuted. But that exercise has some limitation. So that is why I'm drawing your attention to it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I was quoting the 250 because it is in this report that the NI came to give us in this room. That those who can pay 250, there's a premium service for them. Yes. It's in this report, ministerial briefing. Oh, so on a high and in the report that is going to be debated soon after this, it's in that report. 
that there's a premium service for the people who can pay 250. My constituents cannot pay the 250. And therefore, most of them are going to be disenfranchised. Mr. Speaker, that's why I'm crying seriously on their behalf. And that's why they brought me here. So, Mr. Speaker, we need to... I, get... I, I read the report, and I'm aware of what you are saying. I'm only drawing your attention that there are limitations. I'm not saying don't, but the extent to which you are going, I'm just drawing your attention. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that has been established, so I'll hear from there. So, Mr. Speaker, taking lessons from what Dr. Afarijan said, that you don't need a Ghana card before you can be a Ghanaian. And if you don't have Ghana card, does it mean you are not a Ghanaian? These are questions to be raised. Mr. Speaker, this House, before we proceed, proceed on that path, I will open, or this side, of the house who open that Mr. Speaker, you allow the two caucuses and the leadership to do further engagement on this issue. We are here in performing our representational function. What we are being given today is not known to our constituents. It's better we take this report and go to our constituents and tell them, you send me to Parliament. This law is what we intend to enact in Parliament. What is your view on that? We need to do nationwide consultation. Civil society organizations must come in. The two chairpersons, the former electoral commissioner Farijan, must be consulted. Charlotte Ose must be consulted. The academia must be consulted. CDD must be consulted. Imani Ghana must be consulted. The role of Frederick Herbert Foundation cannot be ruled out. They must be consulted. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to conclude by calling on this House to have extensive, extensive engagement on this. What the report says, there must be a, a committee of the whole with the Electoral Commission and the National Identification Authority people. That is going to take place within this chamber. Mr. Speaker, how can we get... And that is not going to be the first meeting. Because if you read the report, the report says they engage the subsidiary legislation to take their input to enrich the CI. Mr. Speaker, my information from the chairman of the subsidiary legislation committee is that the input they gave to the electoral commission was that include the past Ghanaian passport and include the guarantor system. These were the two inputs they gave to you. None of them have found space in what you have. So what is the guarantee that the input that they gave you has been factored in? Then you bring it here, knowing very well that you need to test majority to annul it. Is it Parliament that is making the law, or who is making that law? So, Mr. Speaker, in order for us not to be told that we came to make this law in this form, let's do extensive engagement on this. Let's do extensive consultation on this. We just had 30 years parliamentary democracy under the Fourth Republic, the journey thus far. The following day, we are here, restricting, closing the door on eligible voters. If that had been done previously, would we have come this far? Does you can let anybody prove to me, in doing periodic registration for the district level election, how many deaths were recorded? No death. In doing registration, periodic registration, limited registration for the creation of the state's regions, how many deaths were recorded? No death. So, Mr. Speaker, it will be wrong for somebody to come and say, this is recipe for abuse. So, because of that, I'm closing the door. Is it because we are here? The people who brought us here, Mr. Speaker, somebody voted for me. That person is the remote, he takes canoe five hours before he can get to the district capital. You are saying he must come to the district capital or the regional capital before he can qualify to vote. Oh, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. We are representatives. We don't take decisions on our own. We represent the generality of Ghanaians 
and we need to go back and consult them. So in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, after the Committee of the Whole, that prelaying that the committee is saying that must come on, that prelaying, you must invite civil society organizations, you must invite the political parties, you must invite the chairperson or chairman of former chairperson and chairman of the electoral commission. Let's get all their input so that we can in, in reach whatever law that we want to make. We shouldn't come here and close the door on those who brought us here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity. Honorable members, let's now listen to the majority leader. He... Speaker, let me also rise to speak to the report of the Special Budget Committee in respect of the referral to the committee. The speaker, the point has been made that in bringing this instrument, the regulations, to Parliament, the Electoral Commission is guided by Article 11.7 of this Constitution. And the speaker, for the avoidance of doubt, I want to rehash what the Constitution provides. Article 11.7 says any order rule or regulation made by a person or authority under a power conferred by this constitution or any other law shall a be laid before parliament b be published in the gazette on the day it is laid before parliament and c come into force at the expiration of 21 certain days after being so late unless parliament before the expiration of 21 days announce the order rule or regulation by votes of not less than two-thirds of all the members of parliament. So the EC is coming to us by this route. Mr. Speaker, so there cannot be any, any fault on the part of the Electoral Commission on this. The Electoral Commission, before coming by this route, has elected to yield to this emerging trend of having consultations with members of parliament. Mr. Speaker, that indeed is what the Electoral Commission is doing. We must not bastardize this effort because after all, it's only an emerging trend. It is not founded on any law. The Speaker, in 2012. Honorable Majority Leader, the first duty speaker to take the chair. Then I will continue. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in 2012, 45 new constituencies were created in this country. The speaker, issues were raised. <laughs> issues were raised in this house. And the speaker, how many months did we have to travel before the conduct of that election? 45. We raised issues. This side, the left side of the house, was at a time was headed by my dear friend, the Honorable Clare Sabuka, decided not to listen to anybody. He said all that the Electoral Commission had to do was to come to this house by a constitutional instrument. They had conformed and nobody had any right to question the EC on that. Check your hands. The speaker, so let's not try to bastardize the Electoral Commission. 
However, it is not to say that we cannot also make any inputs into what is going on. And Mr. Speaker, let me, let me, let me quote the um, page four of the report. Page four of the report, um, the bullet four, for Roman number two. The chairperson explained for the record that officially no CI has been presented to Parliament as is being alleged. Because when we met them at the, at the special budget committee level, it was even alleged that the CI had come to this house. They had to explain that no CI had been laid. What they were doing was just a pre-laying consultation. The speaker, they said they were only conforming to the emerging practice of the House by doing what they were doing. But even before they came to us, the atmosphere in the country had been poisoned that the Electoral Commission had smuggled the CI to, to this House. When people who ought to have known better were on radio stations accusing the Electoral Commission for nothing. Mr. Speaker, now the Honorable, Honorable Eric Opoku quoted extenso from the report that has been submitted. And in particular, he related to uh, paragraph, um, page 11, paragraph 2, when he said, and I'm quoting him, that the committee would like to stress that it will not accept and would reject any effort that's geared towards making the Electoral Commission use the Ghana card as the only medium to qualify a person who is eligible to vote in the 2024 elections. Mr. Speaker, what does, this, what does this paragraph mean? Who are the people who are going to vote in the 2024 elections? Already, they have their register, which they are going to add on. And that register was not predicated on the Ghana card. Now, people had alleged that they were going to do a complete re-registration of voters. And we said, the committee said that we will not allow that. Those of them who had been registered already and being captured on their road should remain. The continuous registration is what they are going to use the Ghana card to roll people on. Mr. Speaker, I, 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 I said to one day when we're having a debate in this house, please read the thing again. Mr. Speaker, I said in a debate on this floor that when some of us were engaged in iambic pentameter, some people were struggling to understand the prosaic free West African verse. Otherwise, this is very clear. This is very clear. Mr. Speaker, read paragraph 1 of page 11. It says, again, the committee would like to emphasize that it has no objections to the Electoral Commission using the NIA card to embark on the registration of eligible voters. That is from now on. But those of them who have been captured, you can't come and do a re-registration. So those of them like us, whose names are already on the register, the Electoral Commission cannot register us again using the Ghana card. That is the simple meaning of, of, of paragraph two. So for you to imply that the committee is saying that would like to stress that it will not accept and will reject any effort that is geared towards making the EC use the Ghana card as the only medium to qualify a person who is eligible to vote in the NFD. Uh, for to mean that we are saying that nobody should be rolled onto the register using the Ghana card is fallacious. It's fallacious. Mr. Speaker, read the two together. You, I mean, putting these two together should should lend itself to clear vision and understanding. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, now, the other matter raised by the Deputy 
the deputy whip for the minority. The crux of the issue is not about continuous registration. It's about, it's about clarifying, simplifying, and indeed sanitizing the process of registration. Let's not forget that progressively we have been improving the system. When we started registration, the speaker, we were using first birth, birth um, certificates plus baptismal certificates. Today, where are they? So as we move along, we are improving the system. Mr. Speaker, we used to use um, driver's license. We have done away with driver's license. We are using uh, previous voter ID cards as form of guarantees. We are, dealing, we, are, we are doing away with that. And then Ghana passports. We are, we are using Ghana passports as well. As form of identifying Ghanaian citizens. Now, all that this is saying to us is that after all these, including the guarantor system, where we got into, we can use the Ghana card. After all, the Ghana card establishes your Ghanaianness. So let's just resort to the Ghanaian Identification Authority card. Mr. Speaker, I don't see anything wrong with this. Mr. Speaker, what is wrong with this? Mr. Speaker, what is wrong with this proposal? Mr. Speaker, in the countries surrounding us, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, Burkina Faso, the cause of their registration of citizens by way of voting, they resort only to their cut identity. That is their identity card. Mr. Speaker, so, so when we are using the identity card, what is wrong with it? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, people are talking as if the CI, the constitutional instrument, has already been laid. It's not been laid. And Mr. Speaker, when people quote Article 42, I believe that they are really misrepresenting the import of Article 42. 42 says, and I quote, the Speaker, Article 42 provides every citizen of Ghana of 18 years of age or above and of sound mind has the right, you have the right to vote. You have the right to vote. The Speaker, it doesn't mean that when you are 18 and of sound mind, when elections are due, you can walk to any, any uh, uh, polling booth and declare yourself a Ghanaian. You are of 18 years, you are of sound mind, so you should be allowed to vote. That doesn't obtain. That is why, and I mean as you continue, that is why the continuation provides, and I read it, every citizen of Ghana of 18 years of age or above and of sound mind has the right to vote and is entitled to be registered. So you must submit yourself to the registration process. That's a simple truth. You cannot just say that and the process, the registration process, is defined by the Electoral Commission. It is not you who defines it. You don't define it. They define it and come by an instrument or regulations. If we don't agree, we have the right to acknowledge. That is the position of the law. You cannot say that because you qualify, you must walk to the booth and then be allowed to vote. Who told you that? And since when have we had that regime? By necessary implication, that's the point that you, you seek to make. Mr. Speaker, so you must be registered as a voter for the purposes of public elections. Mr. Speaker, who is that telling you? They are coming, who, they are coming with the vehicle. And this is the vehicle. Submit yourself. Mr. Speaker, so for anybody to say that, and then we are being told that the former minority leader, my, my dearest friend, was saying that uh, the EC is an independent uh, body, and for it to submit to the National Education Authority, which is not an independent body, guaranteed under the Constitution, is improper. And I sat down and I laughed. Mr. Speaker, in this country, 
we base a lot of our, uh, our, our, our projections and whatever on figures that are given to us by the statistical service. The, the independence of the statistical service is not guaranteed under the constitution. And yet parliament relies on it. The electoral commission relies on that. So wh where does this argument come in? That because the NIA is not an independent body created under the constitution, they, are, they, they cannot be relied on by the electoral commission because by necessary implication, they compromise themselves. Where from this? Let's figure out, this really, again, is a fallacy of the highest order. The speaker, the, the, my, my, my colleague, the Honorable uh, Dr. Aine, gave the impression that when the Electoral Commission was given the opportunity to provide evidence of the abuse of the guarantor system, they submitted examples of four abuses. And he says, for the records of this house, that of the 17 million registered, it's only four that they submitted and made it appear as if, as if that was the only one. That is the, that is the greatest untruth. That's the greatest untruth. Mr. The Speaker, they brought them to us as example. But to say that it is the only one, really, I don't see where he's deriving his, his strength for. I don't know where he's, he's getting this from. Really, this house, we are required to inform the populace we don't resort to propaganda. It doesn't, it doesn't solve any problem. It doesn't serve the public any better or any good if you do that. Mr. Speaker, as to when he said that he admits that there were challenges in relation to uh, 15,744 um, um, other persons, and he says that that figure is insignificant, <laughs> my colleague, the Honorable Dr. Yene, is... is is a Christian. He knows of the parable that Jesus gave. That if you have 100 sheep and one goes astray, you leave the 99 to go searching for the one. Even if it is one person, if it is one infraction, you must do everything to cure that mischief. <laughs> the Honorable Okunye Toy is saying that it doesn't apply. You can pick and choose. You can pick and choose. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, so the, the, the issues, Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Deputy, the Honorable Deputy Whip was also saying that we are restricting, we are closing the door to uh, assessing the Ghanaian card because rich people have to pay 250 uh, cities to receive the Ghana card. And then, by his own conclusion, those who, are, who can pay 250 then will not be issued the Ghanaian card. Where is, it, where is it coming from? The fact that you do that to facilitate the issuance doesn't mean that if you are not able to do that, you can't have access to your car. That is not the law. So why do you contort and distort the law to suit your purposes here in, in, in this house? You are totally wrong. You know you are totally wrong and you want to mislead Ghanaians. Mr. Speaker, is that the greatest absurdity of the time when he says that is a resort by the at the uh, Identification Authority to disenfranchise Ghanaians. I, I don't know where you're coming from. Mr. Speaker, the, as the Speaker said, in this House, we are afforded free speech, but free speech must be well informed to inform the people outside. You don't just talk from the top of your head with the intention to mislead and be populist in your declarations in this house. It doesn't serve any useful purpose. Mr. Speaker, there are matters that should concern us. I agree that the CI, which is yet to be late, is talking about limiting the continuous registration to district offices. It's a matter that we should address. But nobody should create any impression that this is the first time it's happening. Throughout continuous registration, that's what has been done. If we want to improve the system, let's say so. And I believe that we should work to improve the system. But to create the impression that this is the first time continuous registration is going to be limited to these offices is rather mischievous. It's rather mischievous. But we, not, not notwithstanding, 
The EC has authority to create many more stations in the continuous registration. And we should urge them to do that. To me, that should be our preoccupation. Second, Mr. Speaker, the other matter that should concern us, by their own admission, when we met them, they said that about 3 million cats are outstanding. They have not been able to issue them. What should be the position of this house? The position of this house should be that you should, whatever it takes, double up your steps to ensure that those of them who have registered and who have not been issued their cards, the three million, are issued their cards. Necessarily, they must be issued their cards. So that should be the common position of this house. Mr. Speaker, every year, every year, about 250,000 Ghanaians turn the age of 18. So if for two years you have not registered them, or registration has stopped, it means that about 500,000, half a million people outside the 3 million are behind the door. What do we do? What do we do to get them on the, on the uh, uh, you know, issued, registered and issued their, their, their identification authority cards? Mr. Mr. Speaker, to me, that should be a matter of concern to all of us. And it's the reason why we have brought, the finance minister has been here the whole day. We are going to go into that. For them to have money availed to the NIA to cover the 3 million, if you like, the 3.5 million people to be issued, to be registered and issued with the identification authority cards so that we can move from there. Mr. Speaker, the, the issue that we are talking about, I believe, is about money. It's about money. Where do we have the money to do that? And we should have an assurance. We should have an assurance from the Minister Responsible for Finance, who is here. The, the, we are broke. Yes, we have challenges. But you are paid. You are paid every month. <laughs> so that should be a paramount concern the Minister of Finance to so avail money the um, NIA to be able to send an issue to the 3 million plus the 500,000 or so people who have qualified because of the stall in the system have not been registered to also be captured that should be the concern of us yeah. finally I'm looking at the issue of um, Article 46 that was quoted by my colleagues, that in the performance of the functions of the Electoral Commission, they should not be uh, subject to any directions. Nobody is, nobody is uh, subjecting the Electoral Commission to any controls. Rather, if the Electoral Commission wants to come to this house with a CI, and you position yourself to say that you are not allowing them to present their CI, you rather will want to control the, the, the Electoral Commission in the performance of their functions. In that case, you rather can be cited for a breach of the Constitution. But you don't want to get there. This because it's the reason why since June, we have been talking to ourselves to address the salient issues. It's about money. How do we get money to pay all these outstanding? In order that no qualified Ghanaian would stand disenfranchised. That should be our paramount concern. That should be our paramount concern. And Mr. Speaker, let me repeat that the Electoral Commission cannot be prevented from, presented, from presenting the CI. However, we must work together to ensure that that should be the conclusion. And to position ourselves that not until civil society people are, co are, are consulted and so on, that to me is too populist. That's not what we are here for. Mr. Speaker, that is not what we are here for. Let's dialogue amongst ourselves. Let's isolate those outstanding matters. How do you deal with them? Unfortunately, when we finish with this, we are going to recline into a committee of the whole to listen to them how to cure the mischief that we have identified. And then we can move on. That should be, that should be the, 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 the roadmap. But it cannot be that somebody wants to uh, you know, pose himself as an obstructionist.
that I will not allow this. What authority do you have? So, Mr. Speaker, I thank you, and I believe with this, we'll be able to make progress. Mr. Speaker, once again, I thank you very much. Honorable members, at the conclusion of the debate, I put the question. Why? Are you on a point of order? Point of order. Mr. Speaker, a little correction before it could be, but I thought maybe the leader would know it. Mr. Speaker, if you look at item one, introduction, it says the Electoral Commission EC of Ghana, led by the chairperson, Mrs. Jean Adukwe Mensa, and two deputies, Dr. Bosman Asari and Dr. Srebo Kwaku. Mr. Speaker, Dr. Srebo Kwaku is Director of Electoral Services, not a Deputy Chair. So since this is a report of this, that must be corrected before I, I don't have that report. The one you read, I don't have that edition. I have a different edition. I have a different edition. And so, uh, you have the... I have this version. Ah, okay. <laughs> You are lucky you don't have the old Bible, but the updated King James. Yes, honorable members, at the conclusion of the debate, I put the question. Those in favor of the adoption of the report, say aye. aye. Those against, say no. The eyes have it. Honorable members, the report is accordingly adopted. Honorable members, in consultation with leadership, we will now take item 25, and I'm informed that one from each side of the house, one from each side of the house, and I will give five minutes each. It's the same thing. What you debated was a report from the EC. Now, what is coming on is the same report from the NIE. So it's the same subject matter. So we just want to hear one from each side of the house. And then we can now go into the committee of the whole. The officials of the Electoral Commission, the officials of the NIE, and the Minister of Finance,
Yes, Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, if I may, just move the motion as captured under um, on page 20 as item 25. Speaker, I will not do any contribution but to yield to the two people that are supposed to do the debate. So I just present the report um, before us. Uh, speaker. Yes, I wanted to get some decorum before I call on you to move that motion. Please. My very good friend, Honorable Fritz Bafo, used to say, violence. So please, let's have some order. Item 25, motion, chairman of the committee. The speaker, the chairman of the committee of the whole is the, um, the first deputy speaker. But the indication is given to me that he's extremely exhausted. So uh, I just want to do the presentation. And as I said, the debate will be done by the two of them. So, Mr. Speaker, without yes. understanding, I beg to move that this Honorable House adopt the report committee of the whole on the status of registration, printing, and issuance of the ECOWAS Identity Card, otherwise called the Ghana Card, and related challenges. Mr. Speaker, in doing so, to present to the House a 22-page document. And I believe that everybody has been said with a copy of the report. For which reason, Mr. Speaker, I would want to urge the Hazard Department to capture the entirety of the document as having been read into the Hazard. Mr. Speaker, I so submit and I so move. Chim Seconda. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that is so. Mr. Speaker, I'm grateful for the opportunity to second the report as uh, second the motion as presently did and uh, moved by the majority leader. Mr. Speaker, in doing so, I, 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 I do so in the following terms. Mr. Speaker, yes, I'm seconding the motion and I'm doing so in the following terms. Mr. Speaker, we were briefed by the National Identification Authority on so many issues. Mr. Speaker, one of the key issues that the National Identification Authority raised before the committee was the fact that they had staffing inadequacies. Mr. Speaker, if, if you look at the issues that they brought, they, for instance, said that in 2001, they had only 133 staffs serving them in the entire country. But this improved to about 1,459 staffs in 2022. Mr. Speaker, the difficulty we had was why, with this improvement in staff numbers, came with the difficulty of serving our people in terms of registering more numbers. Mr. Speaker, the factors that affected the work of the National Democracy Authority in some of the districts as captured in the report include network connectivity problems. Mr. Speaker, for instance, in South Dine, it was for the staff in South Dine, located in Peking, which is not the district capital, though, but the office is cited in Peking to actually have connectivity to be able to serve the people when they capture data. So, Mr. Speaker, that was one of the issues. Two, the other issue that cropped out was language barrier. We also discovered that, for instance, in South Dine, some NIA staff simply could not communicate in every. So it was difficult to serve the people when they thronged the, the centers and their numbers, because you needed people to, to, to interpret and between persons who had come to register as well as the officials who are capturing the data. So even though persons will come early in the morning, 
It took forever for one person's data to be captured. Eventually, at the end of a day, not many persons get captured, and they are told to go back and return the following day. Some persons travel from, say, Ajebe, which is about 45 or 50 kilometers to the center. And, and, and it, 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 it brings them a lot of economic burden to be able to do so. So they are demotivated from going back for their data to be captured. Mr. Speaker, the other matter that came up, which is captured in the report, is about the number of persons that NIA is alleged to have registered. Mr. Speaker, if I may refer the House to Table 2 of the report. Mr. Speaker, the data presented are captured on regional basis. Mr. Speaker, what is interesting that I, what is very interesting is that, for instance, Greater Accra, NIA claims that the 3,178,980 persons and yet they printed 3,226,156. It meant that they printed more cards than the persons that they, 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 they registered. And this gave a difference of 47,177 cards. So this 47,177 cards, who did the NIA printed this card for? Mr. Speaker? One other point that I noted was the fact that if you look at the difference between the enrolled and the printed, as well as the issued, when you get to the issued for Greater Accra, NI said that they issued 2,956,634.33. Mr. Speaker, the question is that we are dealing with human beings who are counted as a whole. Why is the NIA giving us figures in decimals? Yes. <laughs> Which human beings are constitute the decimals or the fraction? So, so, the, so the data the NIA has presented to this house is questionable. Mr. Speaker, with all due respect, this is very questionable and they need to go back and put their house in order because they cannot be giving us differences that are captured reflecting decimals and fractions of human, of human beings, Mr. Speaker. And this is very, very important. Mr. Speaker, the other matter that we noted, which is captured in the report, is the issue of the establishment of premium centers. Mr. Speaker, this is obscene. This offense, Article 17, one of the constitution, equality before the law, you cannot, de you cannot deny people the right on economic basis. Mr. Speaker, what is happening? Asking people that they must drone your office 50 Ghana series in order for them to be issued with Ghana card, Mr. Speaker, with all due respect, it's unconstitutional. They are, because they are using economic basis to deprive others from receiving the premium service. Mr. Speaker, this is my perspective on the matter. Mr. Speaker, the other issue that I think the House must concern itself critically with is the, is the guarantor system or the vouching system. Mr. Speaker, the committee noted that the guarantor system is one means by which a lot of Ghanaians get onto the register. But what, what came to the attention of the committee is the fact that officials of the NIA abused the guarantor system by vociferously interrogating and intimidating persons who are proceeding. I am not saying it. This is the report. Don't say ah. So the committee cautioned NIA to, to re-educate and reorient its officers that they should not abuse the guarantor system by intimidating and vociferously interrogating Ghanaians who want to enter onto the National Register using the guarantor system. And I think, Mr. Speaker, the NIA must take this matter seriously because the deficits that we are looking at in respect of the number of persons who have been captured and whose cards 
or data have not been properly captured and for which cars have not been issued to them is, is, is mind boggling, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, one other factor that we have to bring to the attention of the House is this. If you look at the number of persons who are eligible to be registered, they gave a general population of 20 million three hundred and twenty seven thousand and twenty six as persons who within the Ghanaian population are entitled to be captured onto the NIA register. Mr. Speaker, if you look at what they have actually done, a sixteen million six hundred and twenty seven thousand eight hundred and twenty nine printed cards. Speaker, the difference is that between the eligible and the actual, we have 4,325,779 Ghanaians who are eligible to be registered by NIA and yet are yet to be captured. And that, Mr. Speaker, is very, very instructive. And Mr. Speaker, considering the contemplation by the Electoral Commission to rely solely on the National ID card as the source document for its continuous or, in other words, its limited registration going forward. It is important that we encourage the National Identification Authority to be able to put a house in order and ensure that our people are equally served. Mr. Speaker, we also want to urge the National Identification Authority to open its premium service offices in all the other district offices so that they don't limit the premium services to only some selected regions such as Eastern, Ashanti and the Western region. It is not fair. It is not fair. It is, it is, it is, yes, I have made a point that it is discriminated, but if they insist for the sake of IGF, Mr. Speaker, then we demand that the services is extended equally to all Ghanaians. Mr. Speaker, the other matter that is of that must be of of some relevance to the House is this. The NIA told the committee that they are suffering from inadequate budgetary allocations and releases. And they gave some serious figures that is hampering their operations. Mr. Speaker, for instance, they say that they are unable to, to pay their creditors and suppliers for services that they have contracted these, these entities to, 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 to render on their behalf. And it is part of the reasons why they are, their efficiency is being, is being called into question in so many areas. Mr. Speaker, for instance, they say that they are unable to pay the, the that's if you look at the data harmonization and integration services, they have some difficulties in making payments. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, in order to wind up, let me say this. They indicated that, for instance, in, in 2022, their budgetary allocation of 300 and 326,740,669 cities and 34 persuades was shut down and given a ceiling of 236 million. And this was further reduced to 180 million emergency rationalization measures. Mr. Speaker, if the National Identification Authority is such an important institution of state, which ought to serve our interest, is also affecting haircut in terms of its budgetary allocations. Then, Mr. Speaker, there's no way they can serve the people for which other entities such as the Electoral Commission will want to rely. Mr. Speaker, finally, there is a misreading of a provision in LI 211, 2012, particularly Regulation 7. It is being suggested that there's a mandatory use of the national ID card. But the law didn't say so. The law said those who are issued with the card are enjoined to use it mandatorily. 
The law didn't say that the card must be mandatorily used. It is only when you are determined to have been issued with the card, that is when it is demanded of you to produce it when you are seeking other public services, such as the registration of, of, of NI, NHIS and such other things. Mr. Speaker, with this words, I second the motion on the floor. Thank you. Yes, Majority Chief. Speaker, I'm grateful for the treasured space. And Speaker, let me say that I had paid attention to listen to my colleague, your Honorable Dafemi Kwa, as he contributed to the motion for the adoption of the report. So let me address a few issues my colleague raised from the outset, and I'll reference the report copiously. So are, it is not true, unless my friend proves me wrong, that the report has indicated that premium services are offered in Ashanti region and Eastern region, as my colleague is alleging. It's not true. And my colleague should just come with me to page, page 15 of the report. So with your permit, I want to read. Item 6.2. Payment of 250 Ghana cities for premium service. And he goes ahead to say, the authority in response to a question as to why some citizens are being requested to pay 250 to obtain the card indicated that the fee paying is a premium service for Ghanaians who opt for such service. Premium centers have been set up at Car Bank and the NIA headquarters for such persons to assess the service. Where in the report has it indicated that it is done in, in the Asante region and Eastern region? This is most unfair. And you see, when we speak like this, we create some bad impression from, 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 from the outset. So my colleagues should just uh, take notice of that. Speaker, thankfully, the relevant issues have been teased out. Yes, may we hear from him? Yes. Uh, uh, Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, I refer to a news publication on the on the 19th of December 2022, the NIA, the NIA released a press statement announcing that it has opened its premium services offices in Ashanti, Eastern and the Western region. And this was carried by Major Online. There has not been a disclaimer by the authority. So I didn't say that it was in the report. I am saying that if they saw it fit to open further premium offices in Ashanti, Eastern and the Western, in addition to the Greater Accra region, then it be extended to other offices in other regions. I didn't say that it was in the report. Yes, please. Speaker, I'm basing my contribution on the report, and I wish my colleague would limit himself to the report. Um, so we are proceeding further. Um, let me go on to page 14 of the report. And I heard my colleague alluding to some statistical figures. So it's also important that we recognize where we are coming from, where the NIA has transited from. So that some time back, funding to this institution was a big matter. I mean, at a point in time, the NIA had to close its doors. You see, it, it, it's critical that we, 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 we recognize important progress being made by such an important state institution, and we don't bastardize it. Now, look at the figures. Greater Accra, as my friend, my colleague Riley quoted, 3,178,000 980 came up as an enrolled figure. Then we have printed printed documents or printed uh, details, accounts, 
3 million, out of the 3 million 178, we had printed cars recorded as 3 million 226,000. Issued cars, 2 million 955,634,000 CDs plus. Yes. I mean, this is a, a whooping jump, a massive improvement. Why would you want to discount this? So that if we come down to the total, in terms of the enrollment, we had 16,241,323 for the enrolled cards or applicants. Printed cards, 16 million. Issued card, 15 million. Why do we throw our hands out there and say that all, all is not well and things are so bad. This is a remarkable improvement from where the NI has moved on. So, yeah, so based on the data, there is a clear, significant progress being made. And we must concede to that, encourage the NIA. Yes, I agree there is some room for improvement. But at least the good things that have been chalked, we need to acknowledge it and urge them to move ahead. I also concede on concerns about uh, budgetary allocations. And thankfully, the leader of the House has been able to um, speak to the finance minister. And we have the finance minister here who will be making some statement to that effect. Concerns about limiting registration to district offices is a genuine one. And as a House, probably when we break into committee of the whole, we may have to find a common way to deal with this matter. So the issues really bother on financing, financing, and of course, uh, the matters as raised concerning budgetary allocation. So if this budgetary allocation, there is a clear commitment from the NIA through the finance ministry that these budget allocations will be made, what again will be our concern? I think we should come to some consensus on this matter. We don't need to split our heads. The issue has been teased out. Let's confront the issues at the Committee of the Whole and come to a conclusion on this matter. Speaker, again, we have an understanding issue of cars. The three million outstanding cars that needs to be issued. And, and when, you, when you talk about it, it also goes to funding. So bottom line, we need to get the necessary oxygen for them to prosecute their agenda and make sure that they bring the cars. And I want to emphasize that from the formation of the NIA, the days that NIA could even have staff. Now, if you look at the staffing, the staffing concern as shown, page 12, page 12, speaker, the NIA as of 2021 had requested 1,910 staff to optimally perform. Out of the 1,900, they got a whooping 1,326. That is also significant. That is significant. So, we got not to, at the risk of being repetitive, I think that we are making progress as a nation. NIA, I bet all the difficulties they are going through, they are doing well. We need to urge them, sit with them, discuss with them, and resolve the issue. Bottom line is funding. Let's commit the finance minister who is here to give us a, his word and promise, and I'm sure we can make progress on this matter. There is no need for us to split our heads on this matter. There's a clear path that the House must find and pursue it. Speaker, with these words, I urge the House to adopt this report and for us to break its committee of the whole and deal with all the outstanding issues as discussed. I thank you. Honorable members, at the conclusion of the debate, I put the question. Those in favor of the adoption of... I am guided by the leadership. Mr. Speaker, I said there's some discrepancies on yes. the report that he wants to correct before we adopt it. On the report. <coughs> Yeah, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for indulging me. Mr. Speaker, I've gone through the appendices, and then uh, if I, I may refer the House to 
Appendix 2, or page, page 2. Taking a half, a half, a half region, population aged 15 and above, you see 675198. And then Guineas aged 18 and above, 292732, which is correct. I don't want to bother you with uh, many examples, but if you turn to Bia East, Bia East, population 15 and above, you will see 32,726. And then enrollment, 34,351. Total printed, 34,094. Total issued, 32,882. Issued cast. 1,212, or issued, 1,212, printed, printing, 136. But if we come to Guineas, aged 18 and above, you see 33,659, meaning 18 and above, there are more than 15 and above, which is not possible, because there's a three-year interval. So 15 and above, they are 32,000. But 18 and above is 33,000. How come? And look at the population too. The total population is 32,000. Yeah. 32,000. And you are telling me those under 18, at 15, they are 32. And under 18, 33. More so, than the total population. we have to have a real look at this document. We do the proper question before the question is put. They are cooked. cooked. Are you the speaker? You say no, no, cooked no. Figures. Honorable member, you are right. The I are identified a lot cooked of figures. discrepancies. I identified them myself. So many, many, many discrepancies. Even if you look at table two, you can see Upper West there. The region is not captured at all. Upper East is captured twice, but with different figures. So there are a lot of problems with the data, and I think they have to work on it. It was difficult to call them to make all those corruptions, uh, corrections. I think we just need to call on the NIA to go through the whole data supplied and maybe try to correct the the printer's devil's work. I think that that is what I can say. So with this, we acknowledge your input, and then I'll proceed to put the question. Honorable members, those in favor of the adoption of the report captured as motion number 25 at page 20, subject to the corrections, say aye. aye. Those against, say no. The ayes have it. The report is adopted, subject to the corrections. Honorable members, I will want to officially Acknowledge the presence of the people you invited to be part of this debate and also attend to the Committee of the Whole. We have the Ministry of Finance led by the Minister himself and ably supported by the Deputy Minister. They have been here and they will be part of the Committee of the Whole. We also have, from the Electoral Commission, the Deputy Chair is leading the team, that is Dr. Bosman Asari, is the Deputy Chair of the Electoral Commission. We also have the Director of Electoral Services, Dr. Sribo Kweku, and then the head of procurement 
of the Electoral Commission, Mr. Kofi Che Diodu. They are from the Electoral Commission. The National Identification Authority is very popular here. We have as many as, I think, 12 of them, and they are prepared to give you a presentation of, I'm sure, the corrected data at the Committee of the Whole. They are being led by the Executive Secretary himself. Uh, I'm sure many of you don't know that. Uh, he even wanted to be uh, the clerk to Parliament here. Uh, I, I, I know that because I was part of the board when he made the attempt. <laughs> the prof himself, that is Professor Kenneth Ajiman Atefua, is my very good friend. He wanted to join us here. But now he has a better place, I believe. So he's leading the team from the NIA, and we have the executive assistant to the executive secretary, uh, Theresa Esson Benjamin. I don't know whether that's the daughter of the Esson Benjamin that I know. And then we have the actuarial analyst, uh, Joyce Lane Na Ashon Nati. Yes, we had one Ashon Nati here too. And then the head of operations, Colonel Peter Kwame Gansa. Are you serving or retired? You are retired. Uh, okay. I don't see that here. It's like you are a serving officer. Then we have the head of technology and biometrics, Mrs. Matilda Achampon Wilson. We also have the head of finance. I'm sure he'll be telling you about what they have in their cafes. Reverend Dr. Sebastian Baba Azuma is the head of finance. We have deputy head of finance, Mata Kasei Fasuranti. We have the director, PPRME, Alaji Salifu Abdullahi. We have the principal officer, corporate affairs, Ekuba Kwenoti. And we have the chief operating officer, James Katamanto Kumsin. We also have head portfolio management, Ekwa Chiribwa Asari, and then the head of operations, the Sylvia Boatima Asari. So this is the team that I've been waiting since morning. I apologize on your behalf for taking them through the experience we go through here. We sit the whole day without food, without water, and then we have to do our work. But we invited them, and so we should have been very good hosts. Um, I apologize once again. Next time we'll do better. We are like you. We don't also get the resources from the Minister of Finance. The Minister is here, and I'm sure he's hearing me. Minister of Finance, have you heard me? I said, have you heard me? Even when we invite witnesses here, we can take care of them. And so next time, uh, we'll put item for it. Even when as speaker, I have guests, I can take care of them. Uh, including you yourself, when I invite you to my office and you come to explain things, I can't even get you tea. Uh, and yet, uh... <laughs> Honorable members, in view of the fact that the NIA will be doing a presentation, I want to suspend sitting for a few minutes so that they can put the uh, things in order and then you come back to go through the process of the Committee of the Whole. You have already articulated most of the issues. 
I'm sure you'll be listening to their responses and maybe adding more. Then after that, we'll get the report from the Committee of the Whole, I'm sure by next week, and then we try to go through it together. So with your kind indulgence, I will suspend sitting for how many minutes? Huh? One five. One five. One five. Honorable members, sitting is accordingly suspended for 15 minutes.